This happened two summers ago. It's short, but confounding. I was with two friends in my truck. I was driving, and it was dark, but not necessarily late, probably about 10 p.m. We were traveling to Page, Arizona, Lake Powell area, from Durango, Colorado, and we had to pass through Cayenta, Arizona, part of the Navajo Reservation. Now, I had been to Cayenta before several years prior with a friend of mine who grew up there. We spent an entire day just having a great time with his people. But as soon as the sun started dropping, his mother and grandmother were insisting that we get off the reservation before dark. I knew it had a reputation for the weird, as many reservations do at night. At least that's what I'm told. Flash forward to this trip, and my two friends and I are in the truck. It's a long, straight, unlit, two-lane road with classic red desert on both sides in the daylight anyway. Not that we could see that at night. There's another vehicle coming the opposite way, and there's no crossroad in that stretch. That's important, because right before we go past each other, something I can only describe as metallic went streaking right between us, perpendicular, like feet away from both of our bumpers. It looked to be about the size of an SUV, no lights or discernible shape, but it seemed smooth. It's a weird comparison, but that speeding bullet in Mario Kart is actually what came to mind when it happened. All three of us saw it, and I think the other people did too, because I saw them hit the brakes in the rear view. It was super weird, and I still don't really know how to explain it. This happened a few months ago, and it's really been bugging me. I was out hiking and rappelling with a friend in the hills area near Tombstone. I want to mention that I have spent quite a bit of time solo hiking and camping. I'm used to hearing noises and brushing it off. Anyway, it's late afternoon and I'm the first one to rappel down. I got to the bottom and while my partner was getting ready to follow, we heard this noise that I would describe most like a growl or a snarl. It sounded like it was coming from the ridge above both of us. If facing the cliff, it sounded like it was coming from the right side. We both looked around, but didn't see anything. I encouraged him to come down, and I even half joked that it was probably just a bear or a mountain lion. At that point, I wasn't even feeling that nervous. I figured that once the two of us were together again, we would be pretty intimidating to an animal. While he rappelled down, I heard a loud crash to what seemed to be parallel to me on my left. By this point, I'm starting to get pretty scared because this sound was getting closer and closer. Somehow it had gone from right to left on an exposed cliff face without either of us seeing it. He successfully rappelled down and we both agreed we needed to get out of there. We still had a steep downhill climb to the car. We packed up the gear as fast as we could. As we get our packs back on, we heard what sounded to me like a howler monkey. The noise was close and we still couldn't see what was making it. Of course, it was from the direction that we needed to go. We hauled butt down that mountain and got in the car. I know that it can be pretty easy to let the mind play tricks, but we have the exact same account of what happened. Both of us are really familiar with what's out there, and we've never heard anything like it. Now this is the part that I hesitate to tell, because I know it sounds even more insane. But we both heard whispering and giggling, like it was right next to us, but we still couldn't see anything. I keep trying to explain to myself that our minds just played a trick. The same trick, but a trick. The first noise I would chalk up to maybe a bear or a mountain lion, Animals are stealthy. They could run in front of us without us noticing, I guess. Something else could have fallen to the right side. What made that monkey noise, though? I don't know. And why do we both say we heard whispering? I don't know. 
I don't know if anybody else has creepy experiences in Arizona. I want to believe somebody was just pranking us, but there wasn't a single other car in the parking area. My friend believes that we experienced something supernatural. I honestly have no idea what to think. In Southeast Asian culture, there's a particular ghost or demon that has its head detached from its body. It floats around with the intestines floating around below it, and apparently it glows. If you're Cambodian, you would know it by the name of Arb or Op. I believe in Thai it's called Krasue. You can Google it and get a good picture. Anyway, during high school, I was hanging out with a group of my friends who were all Southeast Asians. We were hanging out really late into the night, probably about 1 or 2 a.m., just drinking and overall just talking about random crap in the parking lot of an apartment complex. One of the guys, real tough dude that was physically bigger than us and never afraid to throw it down against others, had to go relieve himself. He went to the side of the apartments where there were no lights. After a minute or so, we just heard this loud yell of, oh shit. Dude literally ran back to us with his pants still unbuttoned and unzipped, with his pants covered in urine. The look on his face was one of sheer terror. We asked him what had happened, and he told us that he saw an op floating around. Feeling pretty uneasy about the whole thing, the other guys pulled out their guns. We waited for not even three minutes before finally just heading back home. When the older folks in the complex heard about it, they mentioned that one of the residents was practicing some kind of black magic and that maybe she had conjured it, but no one's ever really done anything about it. I mean, what can they do, right? Everybody suspected this girl, but no one really knows. The weird thing though, is that she died later and nobody ever knew why. Back when my mom was a teenager, maybe a little younger, she lived in Cambodia around the 1970s. She went on a boat ride with her mom and some others to who knows where, she didn't really tell me. I guess it was a long trip because she said that she fell asleep. She woke up to her mom calling her name. She realized it was nighttime and they were still on the boat ride. Only her mom calls her by a certain nickname. She decided to go look for her mom while the voice continued to call her. Eventually she did find her mom, but only to realize that her mom had been asleep this whole time. Most people were asleep except the crew. She woke up her mom and told her what had happened. Her mom said that there was a story about people hearing their names being called while they were out on the sea the lake, or any body of water. If the person answers the call, they'll either be spirited away, disappear, or be dragged and drowned in the water. It's a type of evil water spirit. It's a good thing she remained quiet, because neither of us would be here. There are many stories about people's names being called out or whispered. People say that they've been injured. Some say that they've gotten possessed but bad things happen in general. This happens all over the world, which is kind of wild. Anyway, I've always thought about this story and I just thought I'd share it. When my friend and his brother were kids, they went on a trip to the Philippines to visit family. Their grandfather there had gifted them a slingshot. Boys being boys, 
They found a nearby tree outside of the house and started firing away. One of their relatives, I think auntie, told them to stop because the tree was inhabited by a duende. In Filipino folklore, duende can be any sprite-like creature, goblins, gnomes, elves. In this case, their family believed that it was a dwarf. Duende live in abandoned houses, mounds, and trees. They can bring good or bad luck depending on how they're treated. It's believed that if you provoke them, they can cause sickness or death. Well, neither of my friends decided to listen to their auntie's warning to stop using the tree as target practice. The next day, the older brother wakes up with a high fever and felt so weak that he couldn't even walk. The younger brother had a cut on his eye that was swollen to the point of where he couldn't even see out of it. Strange thing about the cut though, he said it wasn't painful at all. Their grandpa made an offering I think it was rose oil, and went to the tree to ask for forgiveness, then applied the oil to my friends' foreheads as well. The swelling subsided and the fever was gone almost instantly. And that's their story about the duende in the tree, who did not appreciate its home being used in such a way. My family has experienced paranormal activity for a while. We were living abroad in Southeast Asia, where spirituality is an integral part of life. We moved into a building on a hill overlooking the jungle when I was three. It was an affluent neighborhood of the country's capital city. The building had many apartments and one big house at the bottom of the hill, which is where we lived. When I was five, we were hosting a dinner party when all of a sudden we hear a bang. A guest bathroom with doors on opposite sides of the room had shut and locked itself on both sides. My dad uses a screwdriver to open the lock, but there was nobody and nothing to be found inside. Creepy, right? But it gets worse. My auntie came to visit shortly after and she claimed to see an old woman every night wandering the top floor of the house, an entity that my mom told me a few weeks ago she would often see when we lived there. The spirits were not malevolent, but they seemed disturbed, and I would often see many black cats roaming around the outside. They didn't seem to belong to anybody. Before we left, we got a monk to come and check the place out. He said that the building had been constructed on top of an old Buddhist burial site, something that is typically not allowed, and that the spirits were not able to rest peacefully. Furthermore, he indicated that the banana tree outside of our kitchen was a hub for spirits to hang out. My parents confronted the landlord, who confirmed that the place was haunted. I'm not very spiritual, but some odd stuff has happened in my life, including that. My parents now always practice feng shui in our house, and for what it's worth, they've had really good luck since then. We moved back to said country a few years later, and we went to visit the place. I was 12 at the time. Sure enough, the building was completely abandoned. The landlord had put it up for sale, and to my knowledge, it never did sell. I've lived in Malaysia for quite a while. I spent a significant portion of my childhood there too. Hontiana is a Malay favorite. I remember in 2000 to 2003, an incident occurred in Northern Malaysia that swept the entire nation. It was a Pontiana captured in graphic detail. It's a widely accepted Taoist and Buddhist belief that if a loved one dies, in seven days, the spirit will return and say goodbye. In 2001, my great-grand died, 
and seven days later, my aunt's maid claimed to have seen her walking around the house. The dogs reacted the same way that they would whenever she was around, too. Jungle spirits are also widely accepted. There are countless entities, but one I will never forget. In the jungle, one must always ask for permission before relieving oneself. One uncle I had scoffed at the idea, and during a camping trip, he disobeyed this. He died of an illness. Strangely, he was the only one of the group who passed away or got sick at all, and he was the only one who didn't ask permission. My mom is Filipino, and this is one of the stories that she told me. In Philippine folklore, the most feared creature is an aswang, more specifically, a mananangal. Think of it like a vampire, but it prefers to eat the unborn. I believe Malaysia and Indonesia have similar creatures, but don't quote me. It's the ones that take on the form of beautiful women, then detach their torsos from their lower body and have wings to fly about. Anyway, when my mom was pregnant with my brother, she took the precautions necessary to ward off the aswang, like sleeping with garlic, even though we were staying with my aunt and uncle in Oceanside, California. She woke up during the night and she was bleeding heavily my dad took her to the hospital on a nearby military base. They treated it and my brother was all right, but the doctors informed my parents that they could find no cause and no source for the bleeding. It gave me shivers. There's more. My grandmother woke up in the morning complaining about how she couldn't sleep because there was some kind of bird being loud outside her window. Hers is the room next to the one that we were staying in. She said that the bird was making a constant wak wak sound. And this is the sound that the men in Gaul are known to make. Singapore. I was lying on the living room sofa in the dark, on my own, just flipping through Reddit on my phone. It was connected to the charger and the plug was right below the sofa, as I had the extension all the way. Then something got caught on the charger cable and the phone got pulled out of my hand and onto the floor. I couldn't see what was behind my phone while reading due to the light from it and the darkness in the background. At first, I thought it might have just been my cat walking past, but she was asleep on my feet. The light that now illuminated the floor showed nothing. I thought I must have just gotten caught on something, so I brushed it off. Not 10 seconds later, as I settled back onto the sofa, my phone got yanked right out of my hand again, and this time it flew a little farther away, as far as the USB cable could go. That area was now illuminated, but it too showed nothing. Nothing that could have caused the phone to be pulled that far anyway. Just an empty floor with nobody and nothing around. from the small country of Bangladesh. And whenever I go to visit, my cousins and family members like telling us stories about all the paranormal things that they've encountered or heard about. They don't have any physical evidence, but they've all claimed to have had experiences with the paranormal. One of the stories I've commonly heard about are old trees, usually willows, sometimes banana trees, around lakes or rivers. It's believed that when a young maiden dies near the tree, their soul resides there. 
the deaths are usually drowning, unaliving someone else, or unaliving oneself. It is only during dawn when she said that the souls start to bother people. She said that hauntings behave like sirens do. To men who pass by a haunted tree during the dawn hours, they appear as very beautiful women. To women, they appear as a sad, lost little girl. When someone approaches them, they stay in their form. But whenever the person is at arm's length, they become demonic and angry and try to harm the person. Some people even claim to be possessed by those souls and get exorcisms performed. A lot of my family members are skeptical about the stories and don't believe them. But if they're outside around dawn, I'll watch them go out of their way to go all the way around an old tree near a lake or a river. So, I don't know how much they really don't believe in. I've never seen or experienced this, but I've had several people tell me the same story, independent of one another. So, I thought it would be interesting to share. The most commonly known ghostly figure of Southeast Asia is the Pontiana. A Pontiana is basically a woman who has died during childbirth and haunts pregnant women to rip the child out of the womb. Another favorite prey is men. The Pontiana is able to disguise herself as a beautiful woman and will use this disguise to lure men to their deaths by digging into their stomachs with its sharp nails. I don't have any stories on those, but allow me to share a story that my cousins encountered in the mid-1990s. Malaysia is multicultural, so it's not unusual to see whole neighborhoods with a colorful array of different cultures and religious beliefs. During a particular month of every year, Taoists burn hell money for their departed loved ones, in line with their practice of ancestor worship. The belief is simply that loved ones linger even after death, and by sending large amounts of hell money to be used in the afterlife, the departed can affect your fortunes. As such, getting in the way of burnt hell money is extremely taboo, even for non-believers. It's akin to taking the Bible out and peeing all over it. It may not mean anything to you, but it's highly disrespectful. People tend to adhere not just out of common decency, but also out of a strong belief that you will be haunted and your fortunes will suffer if you interfere. Burning hell money may be your religious right, but there's also etiquette to follow. Responsible worshipers usually burn the money in burners, but sometimes people want to save a few bucks, so they'll burn the money right in the middle of the sidewalk. I have lost count of the number of times that I've had to take a detour because somebody decided to use up the entire sidewalk for this event. My cousins at the time were Muslim and very young. They were not aware of the customs and cultures of their neighbors who were Taoists. It was at that time of the year again where people were burning hell money. My aunt let her kids outside to play and shortly after was horrified to find her two daughters kicking and playing amongst a pile of burnt hell money. Things went downhill from there. My aunt started feeling that the air in the house was just not quite right, and she would often find my cousins just sitting in the room in the darkness, staring at the ceiling. When asked what they were looking at, the eldest cousin would simply reply, somebody's floating up there. It gradually got worse. One night, she was awoken to find the eldest girl screaming and yelling at something to keep away from her sister. But nothing was there, at least nothing that anyone else could see. Later on, the skin on their legs darkened as if it was bruised. They kept telling my aunt that their legs hurt all the time. It wasn't until my aunt visited a local medium, the encounter stopped. I wasn't there, so I can't vouch for anything, but my aunt is the sweetest lady I've ever known. 
And she's never lied to me before, at least not on that level. So I believe something happened. All this talk of hell money and the like might sound a little outrageous, but being born in Singapore, stories like these used to scare me as I was exposed to these customs and practices on a daily basis. Even now as a full-on atheist, I'm still very wary of stepping even accidentally on any offering that's meant for the dead. So there's been running in my attic for about five years, maybe longer, I'm not sure. It happens every single night, and somehow it's almost exactly 5 a.m. every time. My mom and I used to put it down to just a bird or a squirrel that got in through the window, but there's no way that an animal has been living in the attic for five years without a trace, running around at 5 a.m. for a minute or two, and then disappearing. My mom and I hear the running in different formations. She hears it go in a big figure eight and then stop in the center. I hear it run in a figure of eight several times and then run off to the side, go down, go side to side and stop. I drew out the formation that I hear on paper and it was 81. I'm not sure if that holds any significance though. We both guessed the age of whatever's up there to be about six by the weight of the footsteps. It runs at about the speed that a child that age would. Slows down, stops, and then you don't hear it again until the next night. We plan to get our pastor involved to give us some advice, but whatever's up there, it doesn't seem like it needs holy intervention. It seems neutral. It seems tired. I don't know what we should do. We've never experienced anything like this before, but we know that there's something up there. I have sometimes heard sounds coming from the attic. We store random stuff there year round, and we only go up there about twice a year. The sound is like something heavy is being dragged or pushed across the floor. It lasts for around five seconds, and then it just stops. It's really random. I told my mom, and she said it might have just been snow falling from the roof. But it can't be, because I've heard it in summer too. I haven't heard it in months, but it just came to my mind one day. It also can't be bats or birds, because those creatures don't make the sounds that I hear. Our house is about 30 years old, I think. I have been living here my whole life, but my parents and older siblings moved here in 2004. All I know about it is that the people who lived here before us built the house, but I don't know anything else beyond that. My wife and I bought a house in the country next to a Civil War battlefield in Northern Virginia. The original property was a 4,000 acre plantation that was subdivided into multiple smaller farms. The original plantation house of the 4,000 acre property was situated on our lot 15 yards behind the house with all of its stone foundation, chimney and well. Our house was built in the mid 80s by hand by the previous owner who worked for NASA and IBM. He passed away after a battle with cancer. We fell in love with this house and property. You could tell it was the man's life's work. After purchasing the house for a great price, we walked the property with his widow and oldest adult son. They walked the entire property and house with us. But what I found odd is that both the widow and the son refused to enter the half unfinished downstairs basement adamantly. 
This became a long story with too many experiences to list. My wife and I, over the course of five years, and the friends and family that stayed the night with us, all experienced poltergeist phenomena. From the TV changing itself to the NASA space station channel regularly showing up, the cabinet slamming, footsteps heard throughout the house, an out-of-body sound of somebody clear as day whistling for a dog. These things were heard regularly by everybody. Sometimes the whistling would be right over our shoulder, in our ear, almost like it was messing with us. Sometimes while you were in the shower, the same thing would happen, which was altogether unsettling. One time in the basement, alone, I was painting the ceiling on a ladder. I heard the double whistle right in my ear, over my shoulder, so loudly and clearly that I jumped off the ladder. I backed myself up against the wall to see what was coming. I was so freaked out that I actually ran out the back door to the backyard, and I went around the house to get back upstairs instead of running through the basement to get to the stairs. I'm not easily shaken by any means, but that was too much. My dog would always stare and bark at the top corner of the family room. He refused to go downstairs. I would pick him up and physically carry him downstairs, only to have him sprint right back up and bark at us from the top of the stairs until we came back up. My wife has had a hand brush across the back of her neck multiple times. Sinks, lights turning on by themselves right in front of us, keys and other important small items would go missing, never to be found again, no matter how hard we searched every inch of the house. I would wake up at about 4.30 a.m. to go to work, and I would regularly find the same two doors leading out back toward the old plantation house, wide open with bugs and mosquitoes flying in for Lord knows how long. Maybe all night after we made sure to lock them, we don't know. My mother-in-law was awoken one night by a man's voice asking her, who are you? While living in a haunted house, you really have no choice but to ignore the activity. We got used to it, and it would come and go in cycles. We never felt a bad presence or saw any apparitions. We always figured it was the old owner, and would always joke to each other, well there goes Mr. Copper. But one day, I was home alone, playing on the couch in broad daylight after a long day of work. I heard a bang so loud that it actually shook the entire 3,000 square foot home. It sounded like it came from our large attic. I immediately jumped up and thought one of the large oak trees around the house had crashed through the roof. I sprinted outside to assess the damage, but the roof was completely fine, no downed trees. My second thought was our AC unit, which is in the attic, may have just fallen off its pedestals and crashed through the ceiling. I grabbed a flashlight and scoured the entire attic to find nothing wrong, definitely no earthquake in the area, and no other neighbors felt anything. It seems like the activity in the house has picked up 10 times in the last month while we're there getting ready for it to be sold. It's been two years since we moved and we've had no activity since, but not a day goes by where I don't think about the strange activity in the house. And I always wonder what shook everything from the attic. When I was a kid, I would come home from school almost every single day to the attic door being unlocked. I would ask my mom about it and she would just look at me like I was crazy. The house had full-sized attic doors on the second floor. I would lock the one in the bathroom every single day when I got home. Eventually, after my mom said that she wasn't doing it, I just stopped worrying about it because it freaked me out so much but I also used to hear what sounded like footsteps in the overhead attic when I would try to go to sleep. I ignored this as well for the same reasons. I was the only one who lived on the second floor from grades three to 12, 
I started noticing it at about grade seven. And at about grade 10, I stopped checking on it. We never did find an explanation for who or what was constantly unlocking that attic door. Three years ago, my wife and I moved into a house. It was built in the 80s, but it was in great shape and it didn't cost much. We were excited for such a great deal. We bought it and started renovation on it, which lasted about a year. We moved in and for the first month or so, it was great. Well, one night while my wife was at work, I was laying in bed when I heard a little pitter patter. It was coming from the attic and the door was located directly over my bed. I panicked, being a believer in ghosts and stuff, and I ran to the living room and slept there. The next morning, I told my wife about it, who brushed it off as raccoons or something. She bought some traps and put them up there before going to bed. There were no pitters that night, and in the morning, there were no animals in the trap. She reset them and we left for the day. We got back late and went to bed. The next morning, she found a squirrel in one of the traps. Problem solved. She let it out and we both forgot about it. Well, two months ago, it started up again. Every single night this time. It sounds like something small, running back and forth across the floor of the attic. Every time it happens, I wake my wife, who's a very deep sleeper, but it always stops the second she wakes up. She's never heard them and thinks that I'm either crazy or that it's animals again. We've put more traps and she's gone up there and found nothing at all. My sister recently adopted a little girl and when she runs, it sounds exactly like the noises I hear. I'm convinced that there is a little kid ghost up in the attic. I've told my wife this and she's told me that it's nothing and to just forget it, but I can't. I heard it last night, and I know that I will hear it tonight as well. I know that this story is going to sound like not much, nothing too crazy. But when you experience these things, it's still pretty creepy. There was this one time when I went to bed and I was about to fall asleep and I would hear these loud noises from the attic. It sounded like a box was pushed over and small balls were rolling all over the floor of the attic, almost like marbles. It happened once and at first I thought, well, maybe something fell down, right? But the weird thing is, it would repeat several times within minutes, and it would always sound the exact same. It was like these sounds were on a loop. And then I would start to hear it often. The same loop of the same sounds. I have not yet found an explanation for it. At first I thought maybe it was snow on the roof because that could have caused the sound of something rushing or falling down the roof. But it wasn't snow, and it happened when there wasn't even snow to fall down. Just the same box being pushed over and small balls rolling around, over and over on a loop. I have no explanation. This just might be one of the scariest things that's ever happened to me. My family and I just moved into a little house, nothing too fancy. We'd only been living there for a few weeks when paranormal things started happening as soon as we entered the attic. It was like when we went in there, we disturbed some demon or spirit. Everyone who's gone up there has had a really bad feeling about it. 
At first, I was the only one who realized what was happening. I remember laying in bed. Everything was silent as a stone, and I was just peacefully watching TV. That's when I heard whispering in my closet, which was right in front of me. As I laid there, just paralyzed, I remember thinking to myself that I could get up, slowly, and check. Keep in mind, I was only seven or eight at the time. As I sat there negotiating with myself, I finally persuaded myself to go check. It sounded like at least five people whispering, but as I opened the closet door, nobody was there. The only thing was, all my clothes were swaying back and forth. It couldn't have been wind because the window wasn't open, and I hadn't opened the door fast enough to cause any wind. I repeated it again just to make sure. This went on every single night for about two weeks, and then my family started to catch on. My grandma had been staying at the house visiting and had to sleep in my room with the dog. The next morning, my grandma tells me that my dog was growling at the closet all night long and that something evil was in there. After that, the whispers stopped, but the weird noises, the things being out of place, that never quit. After a while, we just got used to it, but that's when things got worse. This one night, I had taken a shower and gone to bed as usual. No whispers, just straight to sleep. The next morning, I woke up with three scratches down my stomach. I thought it was the dog, but this is the weird part. My mom and grandma both described them as it looked as if something had gone inside me and scratched me from the inside out. At seven or eight years old, I got a little freaked out by that. After that occurred, we blessed the house, but the things never really stopped. My mom and I rode our bikes to the store, and when we got back, we saw a little girl standing in our backyard. So we searched for her, but we found nothing. Our yard was fenced in, it would have been nearly impossible for her to get in there anyway. After that occurred, things stopped. I mean, we would occasionally get a few things here or there, but nothing too serious. A few years passed, and eventually we moved out but we still don't know what we might have released from the attic. This is the second time that I've come home and the attic door has been wide open in the dark. My fiance and I live alone. The first time that it happened was while she was at work. I got home from work earlier and went upstairs to change, and the attic door was wide open. I had dropped her off at work, so she hadn't been home. She had no way of getting home. The same thing happened last night. I had friends over and we went upstairs, and the attic door was wide open again, in the dark room when nobody had been inside of it. The thing is, the attic door can only open if you turn the knob. My friend went to the bathroom before coming upstairs, and he said that he heard something above the ceiling. We told him the door was wide open to the attic, and all of us were pretty quiet for a second. I got the chills and shut the door. Any ideas? I've been reading a lot of people's posts and missing the spirit world a bit, so I thought I'd tell you my ghostly experience from my childhood home. When I was 10, my parents moved the family into a house that was about 80 to 90 years old. The house was built in the 1920s. As a teenager, when I was home alone, I would hear footsteps walking around downstairs at night. I would always hear the faint sound of that 1920s to 1930s party music. Honestly, it was kind of calming to me. 
I would see people out of the corner of my eyes when walking around, and I always felt like somebody else was there. However, it wasn't a malicious feeling. Except one time, but that's another story for another day. My parents ended up living in this house for about 20 years. I moved out about six years ago. This story, though, happened in 2015. I was in the attic with my boyfriend, now husband. It was a big walk-in attic. It's the shape of a square, with the chimney going right through the middle. The stairs are broken up by a landing. I was on the west side of the attic with my husband behind the chimney, meaning there was no way that the shadow was caused by either of us. We were looking for some wrapping paper for the Mother's Day presents we had gotten our moms. All of a sudden, I hear something walking up the stairs. I thought it was the dog since we left the door open. So I look over and I see the full shadow of a human being on the wall of the stair landing. I'm just standing in awe that whoever this is just showed themselves to me. And I tapped my husband to see if he saw it too. He did, and right after he did, it disappeared. I never saw it again, but I always felt and knew that it was there. I'm thinking that this ghost might have decided to show themselves to us since we were moving out right after this happened. Maybe as a little goodbye. I haven't experienced much paranormal activity since I moved across the country, and honestly I really miss ghosts and the comfort that they brought me. Anyway, I hope you enjoy your day, and you can make of this story what you want. I've lived in this house for over three years, and things have happened the entire time. We've considered animals or even a squatter, but we've never found any evidence of either. The attic access is so small and out of the way that realistically only a child could fit. It's a really small tile in the top of a closet. The attached neighbors are pretty quiet, Unless the kids, who sound like a herd of buffalo, are there, but we're accustomed to that. It began with footsteps above the living room. Of course, we brushed it off as the house settling initially. As we heard it more, we noticed that the steps are clear, and you can hear which direction it's moving. A former roommate was in the bedroom with the access, and she said that her closet doors would shake at night sometimes. We had one cat at that point, and he slept with me. As an old man, he wasn't very into mischief. At some point, she checked the tile, and it was moved partially off the opening. Since it wasn't anything malicious, we just accepted that it was probably here before us and left it alone. This was normal for a long time, with random periods of dormancy. Eventually, she moved out and my fiancé moved in. We took over the larger bedroom and never noticed the closet shaking that she mentioned. But we have had a bunch of stuff in the top of the closet, so the tile isn't really visible to keep an eye on it. It was still more of the same until early last year. My vape had the removable batteries to put on the big charger. I figured they were done charging, so I went to grab them and boom, they're gone. I asked my fiance if he had moved them and he denied it. So we searched the entire bedroom and suddenly we find one under my nighttime water jug. The other was still MIA so he said, okay you got us, please give it back now, mostly as a joke. We gave up, but later it was on the nightstand in plain view. This was the start of things disappearing and reappearing. The most prominent and most witnessed was a few months ago with his phone. Both of us and our roommate all searched the entire house. All the rooms, inside and under the furniture, even the fridge. Suddenly, later, it was laying perfectly on the bed, away from the blankets. There's no way it was missed, because all three of us were in the room. 
All the blankets were taken off and shaken. I was even laying on the bed to check beside it. After that, though, things changed. We started hearing things down here in the rest of the house, and it feels different. Before things happen, I get that heavy feeling in my gut. One night, everyone else was at work, and I felt it. I tried to tell myself that everything was fine and that I was overreacting when I heard footsteps in the kitchen. But then I felt a piece of my hair move. There was no airflow because it was pretty chilly, but not enough for the heat to be on. So I got out of there and went to stand outside until somebody came home. Another night we were sleeping and I distinctly heard a man's voice in the living room. Our roommate was gone for the night and the TVs were off. I could clearly hear it coming from that direction. It sounded just like if a show was kind of loud in another room. I sent my fiance to look and he confirmed that no one was there and the house was still locked up. This energy makes me so uncomfortable and I still question if this is the same thing or not. A couple of our friends stay over occasionally because they live at home and want to escape. One of our friends said that she's also had some things happen, last night specifically. On a past visit, she said that she was changing in the bathroom and it sounded like somebody slammed their fist on the door. My cat sometimes likes to body check the door if he's not invited in, but he was knocked out on my lap. They sleep on the couch and at night, She'll also hear stuff in the kitchen, before I even mentioned what had happened to me. Last night, she woke up to what sounded like somebody holding onto the couch and jumping, like a kid would. My cat was sitting at her feet and started staring at the spot, and then ran away like he was scared. She tried to go back to sleep, but it felt like something was playing with her hair, and she said it was really cold. It was in no way cold last night and we don't have a heat pump, so it's pretty warm this time of year. I don't really know what's going on, but I'm really not a huge fan of the new things that are happening. The ghost in the attic always seemed friendly, like a child, mischievous at worst. But this, this just feels different. So I've never been one to say that I believe in ghosts, but there's something here. My boyfriend and I bought a house last year, an old home, almost 100 years old, with a half-finished attic. The attic has this energy. I love it. It draws me in and also our cat. Our cat would live in this 100 degree attic if we let him. The dog is terrified won't even go up there if I'm carrying him, and he'll freak out and run away if I try. My boyfriend is also scared of him. He says he hears a lot of noises, footsteps. The door up there slams shut and opens with all the windows being closed. He said he'll wake up in the middle of the night terrified of what he hears up there. I could sit up there for hours. The energy just feels, I guess, strong and powerful but I don't really feel in danger. I feel comfortable, but he feels terrified. The cat loves it, the dog hates it. I'm not really into this stuff because I've never really believed in it before, but I'm trying to understand what's happening here. How could the same thing provoke two different results? It's so interesting. So I moved into this house and I've been here for about a year now, but about a month ago, weird things started happening. Like I said, my family and I moved into this house a year ago after we had worked on it for about five months. After we finished, we moved into the basically new house. We had torn everything up, 
replaced cabinets, and even gotten new plumbing installed. After we moved in, it was a relief. We had finally gotten out of the moving process. We invite all of our family over for Christmas, one aunt and one grandma. But after Christmas passed, my aunt would frequently ask us how the house was doing, how we were doing, and how our dog was doing. We didn't really find this odd at first. I mean, she's family, and we just moved. So we just figured she was curious as to how we were all doing. But then I started hearing the footsteps in the attic, soft, but definitely noticeable. Since I have a tree that's taller than the house, right outside the window, I just thought it was that. After a while, I got annoyed, and I wondered if it was just really windy at night here. I go outside to see how windy it is. Not even a breeze. So then I look into the attic with a flashlight to see if my mom was up there doing something, but nobody was there. I didn't see anybody. But what I did see was a set of footprints in the dust of the attic floor. And the floor was still creaking as I was up there. I was confused and wondering if maybe the house was just shifting. I went up to where I could see the footprints more clearly. I was just super confused. They were bigger footprints than mine. I'm a 12 in men's. So I go back into my room and the footsteps are still going back and forth, back and forth. I fall asleep after a while, but I never forget it. Fast forward about three weeks of this happening. I finally talked to my mother about it. She went up and looked with me and the footprints were still in the dust. Moved to yesterday. I was talking to my aunt and I told her about it. She asked if anything else had happened and I said no. She's very religious for context. She asks if the footprints were bigger than mine and I said yes. She asks if they happened over my room every night and I said yes. Then she asks if I've put salt in the surrounding area of the attic to prevent whatever was causing all the noise, and I say no. She says, be not afraid, and hangs up. Convinced that my aunt cursed me or something, I guess I'm telling my story to figure out what could have happened. Either she perceived something early on and just didn't want to scare us, or she did something. I'm leaning toward the former, but I just don't know what is happening up there. For context, I live in a top floor apartment where the attics are segmented meaning that we can't access anyone else's attic apart from our own. I've been having this issue for around a year and a half now. At random intervals each day, I'll hear this scurrying or a scratching type sound, seemingly coming from directly above me. For the most part, I chalked it up to rats or birds that somehow had gotten caught in the attic. But I've been questioning this. My family has also heard the sounds, so it's not just me. Last year, I decided to take a ladder and look into the attic. Keep in mind that the roof is quite low, and I also don't trust myself actually standing up there, as the ceiling is thin and I would probably just fall through. I shined a flashlight to look around. Nothing apart from some old chairs, a baby walker that I had as a kid, and just plain old insulation. No birds, no rats, living or dead to speak of. I shrugged it off and went on with my life, still hearing the noises like usual. I feel a little unnerved though. The noises are usually quite quick, but sometimes they can linger. Then what actually brought on me wanting to tell my story is what happened just now. I'm sitting around and I hear a thud coming from above me. I panic and I ask my mom if she heard it too, and she confirmed that she also heard it and thought it was me. I get the ladder and the flashlight once more, and I look up, this time with more intent. 
as I move some insulation and other junk out of the way, but nothing. So the question is, am I jumping to conclusions? Is it a ghost? Is there something that could explain both scurrying and a thud with no evidence left behind? I'm starting to get a little worried. This happened years ago, when I was about 11, so I don't have any pictures of it, but my mom and I remember it very clearly. The house that we lived in at the time was built in the 1930s. It was a three-floor house, but it was all separated into five apartments. My dad and I lived in the rear apartment, and my mom lived in the attic apartment, because my parents had split up. I was in my mom's apartment with her while she was working on something. I was lying in her bed on my phone, and eventually I just zoned out, looking at the wall. It was about 11 p.m., and she and I decided to walk to the gas station to get some snacks. The only way to get into the apartment was through the outside door into the apartment or through the fire escape. When we got back, the door and window were both locked. We always checked, so nobody had gotten in while we were gone. But when we got back, I went into where her bed was and sat down to eat. I picked up my phone, and then I just looked over at the wall that I had been looking at before. I saw my name scratched into it. Then I noticed that below my name was my father's name and then my mom's name was halfway carved below my father's. It was really messy, but it was legible. We have no explanation for this, and we have since moved out of that house. We're pretty sure that it was paranormal, and my mom and I are still completely curious about what happened there. I'm pretty sure that something is in the attic, and it wants to make its way to my room. I'm a teenager who's been living under my stepdad's roof for a while. He had a wife before that died in the house, and now I don't think she likes me. Let me start from the beginning. I was making some food because my mom and my stepdad were both not home. It was just some ramen that I was putting in the microwave for dinner. Once the microwave was done cooking, I walked over to it, but a pan fell on my head. Now I know most people would say, well, it was probably not on there right, but this was different. All of the pans were on the wall. That's where the hanger is, which means this pan had to have been thrown at me in order to hit me in the head. Another time was about a month after this. It was midnight and I had just gotten to sleep but then, out of nowhere, I hear a creak in the floorboards of the attic. Now I've seen some horror movies, and in those movies, if you hear something, then you shouldn't go up there. So, I stayed in bed, hoping that it would go away. And it did, eventually. But then, what I heard in my closet made me terrified. I heard groans from inside of it. After a few more moments, it stopped but then the creak in the floorboard started up again. It was just back and forth, back and forth, moaning. Stop, creak, stop, moan again. It went on like this all night. I had no idea what to do, so I tried falling back asleep, and I guess at some point I did. The next morning, though, there was a pepper on the TV stand. Now this requires a bit of a second story, because my family has a history with peppers. The pepper story started when our late great-great-grandfather was still a kid. He had a mom that died a year after he turned 17. His mom loved to cook and stuff like that. But one night, a pepper appeared on his bed. He asked his dad about it, but his dad didn't know anything. 
Eventually, the day ended causing him to go back to bed. When he woke up, there were more peppers, almost everywhere in his room. But after they cleaned them all up, weird things started to happen. Things began to fly across the rooms without any explanation. Pans would as well. Stuff like that. They moved out after that. When he had children, the same thing happened to them. And when they had children, it kept happening. After generations and generations, we've always figured that for us in our family, for some reason, randomly appearing peppers are most likely a demonic thing. Anyway, I was freaking out and screaming all around because I found this pepper. My parents were out of town, so what was I gonna do? Call the police and tell them there was a pepper in my room? I had to wait it out for a week with the same thing happening over and over. The weird part was, my brother was home with me, but it was only happening to me. And it wasn't my brother. I vetted that pretty thoroughly. I've had countless sleep paralysis episodes since then too, almost every night. I don't know what's going on, but I need help. So my mom and I moved into a house when I was in the fifth grade. For the record, I'm 25 now. There was this room in the attic that looked like it was actually built to be a part of the house and not some makeshift DIY room. The attic was also not your typical attic with a pull down door. Instead, it had a walkthrough door. The layout was in an L shape. It was all wooden and the room was obvious at the end of the L. We used the attic for Christmas decorations and whatnot, but I was always really curious about that room. So I turned the room into my little hangout area. It was kind of awkward, so we couldn't really figure anything else to use it for. The only thing in there when we moved in was a wooden table with four chairs and then some weird bench. I swear it was a bed, but it didn't look big enough. My friends and I would always go in there to hang out and play games and whatnot. Well, one day I accidentally broke the table. I was really worried that my mom was going to be mad at me. I don't think she would have cared in hindsight since the stuff was so old, but still. Out of fear, I just grabbed all the stuff I owned and I left the room closing the door behind me. I think I remember once going back in there a few years later, like ninth grade, but I never really spent any extended period of time in there after that. I would always go into the attic though to stack the Christmas decorations in front of the wall and the door to this room. I just didn't go into the room itself. The year before we moved, we decided to move everything into the garage after Christmas. It was my senior year of high school, and that way we wouldn't have to deal with it when the movers showed up. We never used the garage anyway, and we had gotten rid of lots of stuff the year prior, so there was a lot of room in there. Anyway, that was the last official time that I ever saw the door. The absolute last time that I stepped foot in the house, the stuff was all packed away, on the truck preparing to leave, I was doing one last walk through just for old time's sake when I decided to go into that room just to make sure that I hadn't left anything there. I went to the attic and it was missing. Not the attic, but the door, the room. It was nothing but a blank wall. Like there was no way a room could have ever been there. I was shocked and I asked my mom why they had decided to wall it in, but she said she had no idea about it. In fact, she has no memory of this room at all. I called my friends to verify that they remembered the room, and they did. They remembered all the good times we had there, but she didn't. It was really odd. I've never felt anything weird about the room at all either, and I'm pretty sensitive to paranormal stuff. This just seemed like a random room to me, but then it just disappeared 
And honestly, I still don't know what to make of it. When I was a kid, I lived in a one-story house that had a very small space that you could consider an attic. We didn't keep anything up there because it was just so small. I don't even know where the entrance to it was, if there was one. But, and this started right as we moved in. After we would go to bed, I'd start hearing footsteps up there. I knew they were footsteps because they would move in a rhythm and move from one end of the house to the other. I lived in that house with my grandparents from when I was eight to 12 years old and this happened every night. I repeatedly tried telling my grandparents about this, but they always said that it was just the house settling. I was never able to sleep well as a kid, so while my grandparents would be asleep as soon as 8 p.m. struck, I would be laying awake in bed, staring at the ceiling. It was always the most terrifying when the footsteps stopped right above me like right over my bed. And then within a few seconds to minutes, they'd walk back to some other location up there. Nobody ever believed me that this was happening. My granddad had even found holes that had apparently been drilled in several of the walls, one in the bathroom, and he wrote it off as a previous owner running cables. I lived in that house for four years and I was convinced that somebody was living in the ceiling above us and would become active when they thought we had gone to bed. I will never forget that. It always happened at the same time of night too, right after we all went to bed. This was back in the late 90s and early 2000s, so I don't know if there could have been cameras or something that they could have been watching us on, but they definitely knew when we went to sleep. To this day, I'm still convinced that somebody was living up there. Is it paranormal? I don't know. One of the previous owner's kids did die in the house, and they had a wolf-dog hybrid as a pet that had mauled him in the living room. So, who knows? Maybe it was paranormal. But I know footsteps from houses settling. And I know that someone, whether living or dead, was up in that crawl space. So my husband and I have been living in this house for 10 months now, and I don't believe this house has anything wrong with it. The previous owners seemed to be of the lazy sort. The house seems fine, but for some odd reason, every so often, the back garage door will find itself flung open, even though it's locked. Given the state of the property when we found it, we thought they just didn't do basic maintenance and we figured it was something we could fix. When the lock was intact, we were truly freaked out because we thought somebody had broken into our house. But upon further inspection, nothing was missing from the garage and the door leading into the house was still locked and intact. Hmm. So over the course of time, this would happen several more times, nothing being tampered with that we could see and no one being found. But ever since tonight, I've been on high alert and kind of paranoid. I recently had major surgery, so I had some specific pain meds prescribed to me, which sit beside my bed on a table. I had about 10 left, and I hadn't been taking them the past couple of days. I wanted to get off of them as soon as possible. My husband was about to give me one for pain that night though, but looked at me and asked me if I had been taking them because there were only two left. Today, the back garage door was open again. Now, there's a panel to the attic in my garage and one outside my bedroom. Every time we inspect the back garage door after finding it open, it is always still locked, 
which you can only do from the inside, of course. We literally body check the doors to make sure that it catches and that the wind isn't the culprit behind it flying open. I honestly never find anything out of place, but then again, I haven't really been paying attention to things like that since I didn't really have a real reason to suspect anything was tampered with before. It's just my husband and I, and I know he didn't take my meds. I've always joked with my husband that somebody could be up there since we watch a lot of crazy shows about things like that. But now I don't know if I'm being paranoid or if that's a legitimate possibility. We probably would have thought it was potentially something paranormal, but the medication going missing? I mean, what ghost needs pain meds? And how is that garage door still coming open? When I was in about the third grade, I went into my school's attic. My school was inside of my church. The attic was, and still is, very huge and dark. I went up there with some friends and my brother during summer break, because my mom worked there and it was a work day. Anyway, we went up there and found a grenade or two while seeing creepy angel statues and junk. We were just milling about when we started to hear things, and then we decided that we should get out of there. I don't know if the church is haunted or not, but something was just off in that attic, especially with the statues. As soon as we noticed them, everything just started feeling weird, and we started hearing these strange noises that we couldn't pinpoint. I know it sounds cliche, but I do see and hear things while walking in dark places, alone. As a religious person, I believe that anything is either angels or demons. But I still don't know which one was up there. In 2007, I moved into the house that I currently live in. It's well over 100 years old. And ever since I can remember, there have been weird or creepy things that occur. Recently, I've heard noises late at night while I'm in bed. I sleep on the top floor of my house. Another thing is that in the hallway, we have an attic door that's bolted shut. It hasn't been opened by our family or my neighbors who used to live here, from what I've been told. I decided to ask my father about it, and he told me that it really isn't a full-sized attic. It's more of a crawl space, which goes right over my room. So why have I been hearing noises above me late at night? The part that creeps me out the most is that we've never had animals, beside the occasional mouse that gets in, which makes me think that what I'm hearing is not an animal. It really doesn't sound like any kind of animal I've ever heard scurrying around in an attic or outside. It seems almost human, but I don't know. I live in England in a two-story flat. I've always believed in the paranormal, but my dad doesn't believe in any type of ghost or anything paranormal. I never thought that this flat was haunted originally. However, as I got older, I started to feel uncomfortable by myself. I started to see shadows downstairs out of the corner of my eye. Now, there's an attic directly above our second floor but there's no way for us to enter it, as you don't have any access from this flat. The only way to access this attic is by having a specific key that can open the attic. It's Council Flats, which is above all my neighbor's house. However, the attic above my flat is the only one which is blocked off, 
and there's no way to enter it. I have the last flat on the end of these 18 council flats. There are no neighbors above us, just the attic, which no one can access without that key, and they would still not be able to get above our flat. One night, about two years ago, all of the family was in bed, and it was about three o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I heard something crash above me. It was so loud that it woke up the entire family, and we all got up and just stood on the landing together. After that bang, we heard three loud footsteps and the sound of something being dragged behind those footsteps. It was so scary, especially knowing that nobody could physically be up there. It's physically impossible. My dad was not convinced that it was a ghost. He thought that somebody, somehow, had gotten up into the attic. So he went outside to check if the communal attic door was open. I followed him outside and it was completely padlocked shut with heavy chains all around the lock. I tried to explain my logic to him. How could anyone be up in our part of the attic when it's blocked off and literally impossible to get to? We came back into the house and we were all quite shaken up. My brother was quite young and was able to get back to sleep, but I was awake all night and found it very difficult to sleep. After this experience, I started to smell old cigarettes every time I would enter the bathroom. It smelled so old. After that event, my brother and my mom and I were going away on holiday whilst my dad had to stay here and work. He told me that he slept with his headphones on every night, as even he felt uncomfortable by himself. As a family, we still have no idea what those noises were, and since then we've continued to hear strange noises from the impossible to reach attic. This story is short and sweet, but I still wanted to share this experience. We're renting a house that was built in 1925. This house has had minimal activity, and my husband, a skeptic, is the one who's experienced the most. Shadows, lights turning off, and actually hearing the physical switch click. Strange noises, stuff like that. On Friday, as we were laying down for bed, I heard the sound of a child running from one side of the attic bedroom to the other. We have no children, but I have younger siblings and I remember that sound well. I know what it sounds like when little kids run through a house. When I heard it, I turned to my husband and he just nodded, looking at the ceiling, and then continued to harass me when I couldn't go to sleep. If we had lived in an apartment, I could have easily rationalized the noise. It was a similar level of sound. But we live in a house, completely by ourselves. It went on for about 10 minutes, and finally I fell asleep. I woke up at 3 a.m. for work, and there was no sound at all. It's definitely creepy. I was probably about 12 or 13, and my buddy was spending the night at my house. Like typical kids, we were up late, horsing around and drinking soda. I had curtains up in my room, and they used those old curtain rods that came apart and looked like swords. Being typical kids, we looked at each other, both grabbed one and yelled, on guard. We're right in the middle of our sword fight, and right above our heads, we start to hear creaking, as if somebody was rocking in a rocking chair. Keep in mind it was like 2 a.m., so everyone else was asleep. My house was an old house that was built around the 40s or 50s. I forget exactly which, but it was old. So I chalked it up to the house being old and settling. 
A few minutes later, we heard it again, right above our heads, a slow rocking back and forth type of creaking. We both lowered our swords and looked at each other with a, what was that, look on our face. I said, you heard that, right? And he said, no kidding, I heard that, what was that? I don't know, I said. But being young and fearless, I said, let's go have a look. We go to the attic door and slowly open it. I go up first, being as it was my house and I know the layout. I get to the top of the steps and look down to where the sound had come from. There was nothing of the rocking sorts, just stacks of dusty boxes. We go down to that end of the attic just to make sure there wasn't like a rocking horse or something in the corner. But there was nothing that rocks. We just stood there with that spooked and confused look. I said, I don't know, dude, but let's get out of here. I'm getting a creepy vibe. As we started to walk away, we heard the wood floor creak behind us. But this time, it wasn't a rocking. It just sounded as though somebody had stepped out from behind the boxes. At this time, my buddy, who was now positioned in front of me, got spooked and bolted down the steps. I, on the other hand, was frozen in fear. I could feel someone standing behind me, and the back of me was chilled from head to toe. I didn't want to turn around, but I had to see if something was there. I slowly turned, and about four feet away there was a shadowy figure, standing at about the same height as me with a human-like shape, and it was darker than the darkness itself. I yelled out an expletive and proceeded to run for the door, only to slip on the second step and slide the rest of the way down on my butt. I don't know if the shadow did that or my hysterics, but either way, it was totally freaky. The next day, we told my parents. They replied with laughter and said that maybe it was Granny. Apparently one of my parents' grandparents had passed in the house and never fully left. How true that is, I don't know. All I do know is that that thing scared me so badly, I never stepped foot in the attic again. That was only my first encounter with this figure though, but that's a story for another day. For a brief time in my childhood, we lived in a redone train station in the middle of nowhere, New Hampshire. Small little town with like 400 people, but still a few things to do and a decent amount of wealth. So the bottom floor of this building is a super popular local sub and pizza shop, and we lived right over them. I was like nine at the time, and my bedroom had a very old decrepit door Cliché, I know, but it really was like rotted wood. That door led to stairs, which led to the attic. The whole attic was pretty decrepit, honestly. It was like they had never redone that part of the house. Old, creaky, weird smells, all of it. I got terrible vibes from that attic. I was terrified to be in my room alone. I was nine, so I could have just been paranoid because I was interested in paranormal things at the time. But we lived there for a year, and I heard voices of people I knew, knocks on the door from the attic side, and the door would frequently slam itself open. I eventually asked my mom to install a heavy lock on it because it scared me so badly. We got the padlock, and nothing crazy happened. but. It was the same kind that you would put on a school locker. Now that I had that, the door would just shake and shake, like somebody was stuck in there, trying desperately to get out. That continued for a few months with no escalation, just this door that seemed to be alive. Our kitty had found a way to sneak up to the attic and back through a rotted part of the door. And one day, we hadn't seen her for a while. We checked up there, 
and we found my cat, dead in the corner of the attic. We thought maybe it was rat poison that we didn't know was up there, but the vet never found any poison in her system. The vet wrote it off as old age, but she was only five. I guess it's possible, and my mom just didn't want to spend more money trying to find out why it died, but it was still really traumatic. Things just got worse after that night. I started to hear my mom up there, a lot, and I would just assume that she was up there cleaning or something. She would just say pretty normal things, like somebody would if they were talking to themselves, and it was definitely her voice. Sometimes she would ask me stuff, like if I wanted anything at the store, or what I felt like for dinner, if I was going anywhere this weekend, the things she asked me pretty regularly. It was loud and clear, not different from her normal speech at all. So I would always answer the questions, but then I wouldn't get any reply. So I'd go up there, and I would see that she wasn't up there. And a lot of the time, I would find out that she wasn't even home. Eventually, I stopped checking to see if she was up there, and I stopped replying too. My mom heard it herself twice. She was cleaning my room and she said she heard somebody in the attic. And the first time she assumed that it was just somebody down in the pizza shop and that the sound had carried. But the second time, my mom heard herself call my name and then say, I'm back from the store, come help put the stuff away. My mom got scared and finally believed me. It was like a recording of her talking. After we became more aware of it, it just stopped. But there was one more time that we felt it. My mom was cleaning my room, and I heard her yell, No. Then she had a seizure. I called my friend, who called medical support and the cops. I moved out soon after. It was still the weirdest and really the only undeniable paranormal experience that I've ever had to this day. I just moved into my house in the mobile area. It's a two-story house with a huge attic. It's not big enough to stand up in, but you can get on your knees up there. To give you some insight, the entrance to the attic is in my bathroom. I have been hearing footsteps up there every morning, even when nobody is home. I have also heard voices in my bathroom, but every time I check to see who it is, nobody's there. The weird thing is that when I went into my mom's room, she said, I'm glad you're staying in here today because yesterday morning I heard this huge boom in the attic. I'm scared to go up there and actually investigate. I lifted the door and I saw a flashlight and face cream, but they're not ours. I also saw it looked like a light at the very end of the attic. I don't know what I should do. At first, I thought all this was paranormal or something, but now I'm confused. Maybe somebody's living up there. The worst part is that the attic has an exit that goes directly outside. So, I'm leaning towards something or someone being in our attic. The thought of it being someone scares me even more. About two years ago, my mom told me to go to the attic to put away some decorations from Halloween. I made a few rounds when all of a sudden I noticed a cat out of the corner of my eye. It had no body or head, just white ears, legs, and a tail. When I told my mom about it, she went to the attic to try to find it, but she found nothing. The other time I believe that I encountered it was when I was walking to my parents' room. I started to hear a cat screaming at the door of the attic. It sounded like a kitten or a young cat. None of my cats scream like what I heard. I opened the door and the screaming stopped and there was no cat. When I told my mom about the screaming, 
She went up to find my oldest cat under the guest bed and nowhere near the door. Also, the cat that I saw didn't look like any of our cats, even from the parts I could see. I'm not sure if it's a spirit of my neighbor's cat that died a couple of years ago, or something else, but it's definitely weird. I have a weird story to tell you, but I promise that it's true. This happened about 10 years ago. It was at night. My older sister and I were on the second floor, spending the evening with our oldest brother and his wife. I can't recall what we were chatting with them about, but after a while, about 10 o'clock, my sister and I decided that it was time to go to sleep. We're heading downstairs. My brother has a switch right next to his main front door, into the stairs, that controls the light of the attic, where the stairs come to an end. We usually just put useless stuff there. It's a very small room. The rest of it is just flat, empty roof. So as we're heading down, we notice that this light was on in the attic, so I switched it off. Then, both my sister and I heard the exact voice of my mom saying, Turn on that light, I'm up here. Now, we were both certain that it was my mom and that it was coming from upstairs, so we didn't say anything and I turned it back on. We headed downstairs and that's when we both were totally shocked. As we opened the door to find my mom drinking tea with my other brother and the TV on, we froze, unable to move or speak. My mom noticed that something strange was going on, so she asked us what was wrong. After a moment of silence, we explained what happened. She didn't say anything, but told us to go to sleep. Of course, I couldn't. I kept thinking about what had happened the entire night. Who or what made that sound, and how did it do it? I mean, among all voices, the one of my mom is the one that I know the best the one I grew up with, so how could it mimic it well enough to fool both my sister and I? To this day, whenever I ask my sister if she remembers what happened, she says, yes, and then immediately changes the subject. Almost every single night, I walk up to the attic to chill in there or whatever, and I've never stumbled into anything weird. Just that one instance, but who knows? I don't know if there's anything bad about this, but it's freaking me out anyway. In the place that I'm living in, we don't have an attic. At least that's what my parents keep telling me. But once in a while, there's something that's above me that keeps following me whenever I move. If I move to the hallway and to my bathroom and wait a little, I can hear loud creaking and footsteps above me, moving in the same direction and stopping right above my head. This started off small, and I thought the place was just an old house. But it's just so loud now that it feels like somebody's up there. The noises are way too loud to be a small animal's. Also, I don't know if it's related, but one night when I was on my computer in my dark room, I didn't see anything, but I could tell that there was something staring at me to my right. My brain screamed at me not to look, but that feeling wouldn't go away for hours. When I eventually tried heading off to sleep, putting my computer to the side for a light source, for some reason I decided to put up my legs, and I swear I felt something trying to pull or push them down hard. Nothing like that has happened again since that night, but part of me feels like it may happen again. Another thing that's weird, too, is that I haven't heard the sound when it wasn't physically possible to, like when I listened to music or had my ears blocked. So, I think it's more natural than supernatural, but I don't know. Either way, it freaks me out.
My brother used to live in the attic of the house we grew up in. It had an extremely dark and suffocating vibe. My brother went crazy in there. He would hear voices. He would be paralyzed, unable to move. He got an EEG done, but they couldn't find anything wrong with him. But after that, he had major behavioral issues. He had to go and live in this boarding school place for kids who had behavior problems. Unfortunately, he ended up ending his life. This was 25 years ago, so I have had time to heal a lot, but it still is hard. One day, I was on the second floor, and I heard dripping coming from the attic. I didn't want to go up there, but I needed to know what the cause of the dripping was. In the hallway, there was one hallway that connected three rooms. There was a random big puddle of water. It felt wrong, completely out of place. The ceiling above it looked normal, and the dripping stopped once I came to the puddle. I never heard it again. Nothing was wrong with the roof. My mom called a plumber, and there were no pipes near that area. It was one of many strange things to happen in that house, but it was definitely the strangest, since there was physical evidence of something. Who knows what, though? I live in an apartment on the very last floor. There's a little attic space in between my ceiling and the roof of the building. There's nothing in this attic. I don't have access to it and neither does anybody else. The door of the attic is locked and only the homeowners association has the key to it. The thing is, I hear noises like somebody is walking and stepping really hard on the floor, things falling, scratches, and it's almost like somebody is pushing heavy furniture. Again, this place is completely empty, at least it should be. The noises can be heard at any time of the day, morning, afternoon, and of course, at night. The only part of the apartment where you can hear the noises from is my room though. I don't know what it is. In the home that I live in, there are multiple floors. And when I sleep in my normal bedroom, beneath the floor under the attic, I don't care if my door is open or closed, but I hate when I have to go to sleep with the door to the staircase up to the next floor open. I just don't want it that way. It feels wrong. There's also a bedroom where the floorboards creak every night. I'm always first with going to sleep, so there's plenty of light and relatives passing by. What kind of feels like a safe haven? Well, one time I was renovating my room, and I had to sleep on the floor beneath the attic. Basically, the stairs go up to a large room, from where every other room can be accessed. You always need to go through this room to get to it. This room is also the entrance to the attic. I never liked leaving a lit room after dark when I'm on my own. I even heavily dislike entering the house when nobody's on the ground floor. Luckily, you can just activate a time switch on the staircase that switches off the light located there, 10 minutes, and use this light to get to the room where I had to sleep in. I would activate the light switch there and close the door. So I was in there and when I wanted to go to sleep, I would leave the door open a bit. I have a cat, and he often comes in at night to sleep on my bed. That's the reason that the door to the staircase has to stay open. I opened the door, switched off the light, put the cover in front of my window, which my mom told me to do, and went to sleep. The room was pitch black with that cover on. I'm lying in bed, just like normal, 
and suddenly I felt terrified. There was no real reason for it. I was just thinking about some random stuff that didn't scare me at all. And then I just froze like I couldn't move anymore. And that's when I heard breathing. At the same rhythm of mine, but coming from a corner. I held my breath, but the other breathing continued. I jumped up and felt my way to the door with my eyes closed. I switched the light on and closed the door. And I just sat there. Asking for another bedroom wasn't an option, so after about a half an hour, I decided to try again with the door closed, while repeating in my head that it was just the wind. I didn't hear the breathing sound again, though the wind sounded very similar. At the third night, I forgot the covers, and the window started creaking, like something heavy was on the wood around it. Eventually, it stopped and I could sleep like usual. But I had a really bad feeling every time that I turned those switches off and hurried to bed. And I would take any other bedroom as long as it wasn't on that floor. It's like the closer I sleep to the attic, the worse I feel. So this happened a few years ago, when I was around the age of 18. A group of friends and I were staying at this friend's late grandparents' house in a ghost town in the mountains of Italy. The house is built on two floors, with a small courtyard on the front and stairs connecting the two floors on the outside of the house, accessible from the courtyard. When this happened, we were chilling out in the courtyard. Some other people and I were facing the entrance of the house and we were able to see the inside of the second floor, specifically the one central corridor with the door to the different rooms. Two people got inside the house and went into the bathroom, which is at the end of the corridor, on the right. A few minutes later, they got out and called for us, asking if somebody had opened the trap door leading to the attic, which is located at the very end of the corridor right outside the bathroom. That's where things got weird. There was no way for someone to open the trap door, as you would have needed a ladder to get there. The ceilings are quite high, and the only ladder could be found at the ground floor, locked behind the front doors. Also, all of us who were facing the front of the house and looking directly to the inside should have noticed if someone or something was moving. And similarly, the two people in the bathroom should have noticed something as well, as the bathroom has one of those opaque glass doors. As soon as we all realized that there was no way someone in the group could have done it, we all got inside the house, but nobody really had the courage to look into the attic. So we just closed the door and tried to go on with our day. But everybody kept feeling quite uneasy for the whole time, seeing weird shadows or hearing steps coming from the attic. I suppose it could have easily been power of suggestion. I don't know how we did it, but somehow we all fell asleep. In the morning, after some friends finally decided to go check the attic, the room was completely bare. The only thing that they found there was a hammer, standing on its head in the middle of the room. It's fair to say that only creeped us all out more, and it really didn't make us want to look into the attic or whatever had happened more than we needed to. So again, we all just got out of the attic, closed the door, and we were very glad to go back to the city later that day. There's this little access to the attic in the place that we currently live. We never noticed it until our roommate pointed it out trying to mess with us. So my best girlfriend and I were doing laundry one day in the garage. The access is located in the garage above the door. I was staring up at it as she was sorting laundry. It moved open slightly and I told her. Then it moved closed and I told her. She looked at it and we laughed all creeped out, and then we got paranoid. So we went inside and we were still talking about it. I creeped her out talking about those videos of people living in others' attics. 
Well, we turned the air off and waited for it to go off. We stood in the garage looking at this thing for like five minutes. We were going to go inside because nothing was happening. And just as we said that, it flung open. Fast. We ran inside screaming. The boys swear that it's from opening and closing the garage door. But we weren't opening the door when it happened, so we're still pretty weirded out by it. I'm still not sure what's going on with it, if anything, but I just thought I'd share. Some of my friends and I ventured into an old abandoned hospital that's pretty securely boarded up. We climbed through a broken window that was maybe eight inches at most. It was nighttime, and most of the large hospital campus is abandoned, with welded doors and boarded windows. And though people had obviously gotten in before us, there was much less graffiti and damage than we're used to seeing in these places. The campus has several buildings, and we were clueless as to which one we were in, until we found a morgue in the basement and medical equipment strewn about. We didn't hear anything or see anything out of the ordinary, except for the light in the attic. The building had no power, yet we could see from the top floor that a light was on above us. We couldn't get into the attic, as the only staircase up there had a chained and bolted door. It was a little odd, but I'm not sure if it was paranormal. I suppose it could have been a solar-powered light, but why? Would the bulb ever go out? It didn't scare us off, we did continue wandering around for a while, and like I said, nothing crazy happened. But it's still very strange to me that there was a light on in a powerless attic. My parents own a sprawling three-story manor built in 1912. This house has a finished bedroom in the attic, which is mildly weird on its own. But when I turned 14 and was going into high school, I begged them to empty the junk out and let me live there. I thought it would be totally awesome, like having an apartment away from the rest of my family. They agreed I could do it, and I got to paint it and put in new carpet and fill it with the furniture that I picked out. All vintage, because that's what I like. The place was awesome, but the door didn't quite fit into the jam anymore, so it would swing open on its own. I was not cool with having the door open to the rest of the attic in the middle of the night. I shut the door as tightly as it would go, and before bed, I jammed it shut with my desk chair. I mean, I really wedged it in there. I had my sister test, and the door would not budge from the attic side. Cool. I went to sleep. The next morning, I woke up feeling refreshed, until I noticed that the desk chair was tucked back under the desk. The door was shoved all the way open, so hard that it had actually dented the wall, and I had no explanation. To this day, all present family members swear they didn't do it, and I think I would have had to have heard them anyhow. I decided the ghosts in the attic didn't like me shutting them out. For the duration of my time living in the attic, several years, I left the door open, and nothing else really happened. So, I guess all they wanted was some freedom. Still, definitely freaked me out. I live alone, unless you want to include my cat, and then I live with a cat. I have a house with an attic conversion, but since it's just me, it's basically an empty room. I think the previous tenant had used it as a bedroom. Obviously, when I first moved in, I did go up there just to have a snoop around. There are two light switches for the room, one at the bottom of the stairs, 
and one that is a long string that you pull, which is right in the middle of the room. There's a door at the top of the stairs that I always keep shut. I close every door behind me. An open door really bugs me. After living in this house for about three months, I noticed that the door was open and the light was on. I could see the light on the wall opposite the door. No big deal. I obviously forgot to shut the door and turn off the light, so I go and do that. About two weeks on, I arrive home from work. It's early January and it's dark out. I can see the window to the room from outside, and I can see that the light is on. My first thought is, ugh, I've been robbed. I barge into my home, quickly sweep the first two floors expecting to find someone, but there's no one there. Ah, they must still be up there, I thought. So I fly up the stairs, and the door is shut, but the light is still on. I swing the door open, and nothing. I will say that I'm very skeptical about stories when I hear feeling of dread or felt I was being watched, but I had both of those. I had this horrific feeling that I really wasn't alone up there, but it's a simple empty box of a room. I try my best to shrug it off, I turn the light off and I shut the door. I've been living there nearly seven months now, and since that day, I get the same feeling when I walk past the stairs to the attic. Day or night, the light is on at least twice a week, but now it switches itself off after a while. Recently, I've started hearing very loud bumps coming from the attic, which is right above my bedroom. The first time I heard it, I naturally assumed that somebody was trying to get in through the attic window, so I ran up there, but nothing. Lastly, my cat, who is very tiny and during the night stays downstairs, refuses to go up there and has actually done the whole arched back hissing thing at the door. It could be because he's just out of sorts, but given the situation and the fact that he never hisses at anything ever, it really freaks me out. This is the first time I think I've encountered something related to the paranormal. If anybody can help me understand what this might have been, please tell me. Before I start my unexplained encounter, I would like to say that I live in a duplex with my roommate and friend who goes to college with me. The duplex isn't that big, and neither is the attic. It's small enough to where an average-sized person would have trouble even crawling through it. I also have one camera on the front window and one on the back. So on January 24th, I had suddenly been awoken at about 4.30 in the morning. I checked my phone. I usually wake up about 7 or 8 a.m. so I can get to work on time. At first, I didn't really understand why I was awake, so I decided to just try and fall asleep again. But after a few seconds, I heard what sounded like very loud footsteps walking above me. I was too afraid to get out of bed, so I just laid there. My first thought was that it must have been an illusion, but now I know this isn't true. When I suddenly woke up a few hours later, I went out to eat breakfast with my roommate. We asked how each other's sleep was, and I decided to bring up the fact that I had heard something at about 4.30. He responded by saying he had heard something at exactly 4.34 in the morning. At this point, we were a little bit freaked out, so we decided to open the hatch into the attic. Like I said before, there was really no way anybody could fit up there because it's just too small. We decided to look at the camera footage, but there were no signs of any motion or anything out of the ordinary, other than just leaves blowing around. Our only thought was that somebody had come from one of the sides of the house and climbed onto the roof for some reason. I asked my neighbors if they had seen anything, and they said no, so that kind of eliminated one side. But I also knew that it wasn't the other side, due to the fact that we sleep on that side and would most likely wake up easily if there was a disturbance. Now we're stuck, believing that it's something paranormal. Since then, we haven't heard a noise 
but it's only been a few days as I'm writing the story. And before anybody says anything, it is not an animal. We know what those sound like. These are footsteps. But like I said, it's pretty much impossible that somebody with footsteps, physical anyway, could be walking around up there. Anyway, if you have any ideas as to what it might be, let me know. I've had many paranormal experiences growing up, all very different. On this night, I saw something that I never thought I could see with my own eyes. I slept over at a friend's house one night, and that night, as I was laying on the floor next to her bed, my head was by her feet, facing the stairs leading down to the second floor. I closed my eyes. I could feel somebody staring at me. Their presence was dark, and something told me to open my eyes. There he stood, at the top of the attic stairs. I couldn't see his face or his body, just the outline of him. A completely dark shadow of a man. He stood over us, staring a hole through my soul, and I, completely unaware of how unreal he was, couldn't move or blink. I could only stare back. It wasn't until what seemed like minutes had passed that I was finally able to close my eyes again, and somehow I fell asleep. The next morning, I had asked my friend if her siblings had one of their guy friends over, being that one of her sister's rooms was next to hers in the attic. She said no, that nobody but us had been in the attic that night. I was confused. I told her about the man I had seen, and she turned pale white. She goes on to say how she felt like somebody was holding her down, she couldn't move or breathe. Later on that day, her older sister, who we evidently told the story to, had told us about the man who had lived and died in that house years before their mother bought it. A man in his early 30s had committed a murder of his children, three daughters, and then himself. Since then, he has haunted the house and would bother the females in the house. All she knew about that man was just that, what he had done. Nobody knows why he would do all those things, but what I saw was very real, and I'll never forget it. So this happened a few months ago. I was babysitting my baby brother late at night. I'd say around 11 o'clock. I have a video baby monitor with me almost all the time, apart from this one time where I left it in my room while I went to grab a drink downstairs. While downstairs, I heard a loud crash coming from my parents' room, where he sleeps as he's quite young. I also hear him crying. Obviously panicked, I rush up the stairs, and I find that my brother is sleeping soundly but my parents' TV is on the floor, and the screen is cracked. I put it back up and just hoped that my mom would believe me that I had no idea how it had fallen. Considering that it's quite heavy and on a stable surface, and the cats can't even knock it over, I was quite confused. Go forward a couple of minutes and I'm in my room, just relieved that my brother is safe. But I feel this constant negative energy Anxiety just filled me, and I could feel eyes on me, but I knew that no one was home. Soon after my parents' return, I tell my mom what happened. She checked my brother and the TV. She calls me in and says, what crack? I walked in to find that the TV was completely fine. I still can't explain what happened. I have this memory from when I was like three or four. 
I was being babysat by an uncle, and it was just the two of us in the house. I was sitting on his lap, and he was reading me a story. We were in a large recliner. All of a sudden, something moved above him. I looked, and I noticed an arm that came up over the back of the recliner and rested lifelessly next to my uncle's shoulder. It was pasty and thin, and suddenly I started to realize that this was not his arm. The second that I realized that, I became inconsolable. I screamed and screamed until my parents picked me up. I was far too young to articulate what I had seen, and they probably assumed that I was just cranky and ready for bed. Nothing else ever came of it, but I still remember it to this day. In fall of 2019, I started babysitting for a new family. They live in a house that was built in the 1920s. I've always believed in angels and demons, not necessarily just ghosts. One of the first times I was babysitting the three-year-old and the one-year-old, I was putting them to bed, and I thought I heard somebody knocking on their front door downstairs. I looked out the window to see if the parents were home, but nobody was there. I decided to just ignore it. Another time, again, I was putting them to bed, and I heard what sounded like a man and a woman having a conversation in the kitchen. So, assuming the parents had gotten home, I walked down to greet them, but nobody was there. Yet another time, I was watching them during the day when the mom was out of town and the dad was at work. I expected him home at about 3.30 p.m. The girls were napping upstairs and I heard the kitchen door open and footsteps. I was surprised that the dad was back so early. As I turned the corner to go greet him in the kitchen, I saw what I thought was him, black suit and all, walk past the door frame. As I entered the kitchen, I started to say, didn't expect you back so early, but there was no one there. The last time I ever babysat them, I was playing in the backyard with the girls. Let me remind you that the oldest one is three. She's constantly scared to be alone in the dark, which I thought was strange because usually at such a young age, kids haven't really had any experiences to make them this afraid of a particular thing. That day, she said, I saw a slender man in my bathroom mirror and he waved back at me. I was terrified. I asked her to repeat what she had just said several times. Slender man. She is three. There's no reason for her to already know what that means. At that moment, I realized that I always closed her bathroom door just because it felt creepy. And whenever I would come back into the room later, the door was always open. I have never babysat for them again. So 30 years ago, I'm about 13 to 14. An older friend and I are babysitting for a six-year-old girl and her younger brother. We had been told that sometimes the girl complains about seeing a ghost man in her bedroom and upstairs at night, and that he comes out through the attic door. Now, I didn't believe a word of it. Kids are weird and they say weird things. We get the kids ready for bed, but they would not settle. The girl said that she felt scared and her little brother started crying. She asked if she could sleep in her mom's bed until she got home, and the little brother wanted to go with her. So I tucked them in and I told them some silly stories and I laughed until they were both tired. Both kids were virtually asleep when we left. Door ajar, hall light on. An hour later, we're sitting downstairs watching the equalizer and all was good. 
the kids were definitely asleep, as I had to sneak past their room to use the bathroom. I even had a quick peek on my way back. The little brother got a bit of a mini shoot snore going on, but everything else was quiet. Back downstairs, we watched TV a bit more. About 20 minutes go by, and out of nowhere, we hear banging. Heavy, heavy banging. The kids start screaming immediately. I run up the stairs and meet the kids as they're running out of the room. Now before, I thought it was the kids, but this time I have my eyes on the kids, so I know that they're not making the sound. And we hear it again. Bang, bang. The kids fly at me. I grab the little brother and we rush down the stairs into the front room, shut all the doors, and all crash onto the sofa. Everything is silent, apart from the TV, which I turn off. We sat in silence for about five minutes, just kind of holding each other. After a few minutes, the little girl, with tears in her eyes, just says in a very matter-of-fact way, The man was angry because I wasn't in my room, so he tried to push over the wardrobe and then started thumping the wall. This event has stayed with me all these years. When I was about 12 years old, my family and I moved into a semi-detached house just up the street from our previous home. The house wasn't very big, and the floor plans for our part of the house were completely different from our neighbors. Our neighbors were a lovely little family of four. The husband is from England, the wife from Norway, which is where I live. They also had a little three-year-old girl and a six-month-old baby boy. Now, I love children. I always have. And at that time, I really wanted to start babysitting. It's quite common to start babysitting at age 12 here, and I was turning 13 a month later anyway, so I wanted to find some small jobs. As we got to know our neighbors over the first few months of living there, my parents told the neighbors that if they ever needed a sitter, it would be nice if they would consider trying me out. Seeing as it would be my first job as a babysitter, we thought it would be smart to start with the next door neighbors, seeing as my parents would literally be on the other side of the wall if anything happened. Cut to a Friday night when my neighbors went to a party that was happening just down our street. I got there at about 8 p.m. and the parents told me that they would be home between 2 and 3 a.m. Both kids were already asleep, so they told me to just put on a movie and relax. Now, these kids were the easiest kids to babysit ever. Once you put them to bed and they fell asleep, absolutely nothing would wake them up. They are some of the heaviest sleepers I've ever seen, so babysitting them was usually pretty uneventful. I was on the couch watching Avatar in the living room on the second floor. The kids had their own separate bedroom that was just downstairs where the front door was. I could basically see their bedrooms from where I was sitting as the place was quite small. Because of the hallway, I couldn't see the front door. The house was pretty small, so as long as the TV wasn't on too loudly, I could hear everything that was happening downstairs. At about midnight, I heard the front door unlock and my neighbors walked in whilst talking. I heard them close the door and they started taking off their jackets and shoes. I thought it was a little weird that they hadn't called to let me know that they were coming home early, but I assumed it must have just slipped their minds, so I went downstairs to greet them. I could hear them talking up until the point that I came around the corner in the hallway that led to the door. There was nobody there. The talking fell silent the second I turned the corner. The only sound was from the TV upstairs. My heart started beating so fast and my head was rushing. I ran to the bedrooms and checked the kids before I searched the rest of the house. I opened every door and checked every cabinet for anything that could have explained what just happened, but there was nothing. The kids were sound asleep. Eventually, I convinced myself that I was imagining things, 
I checked on the kids one last time, just to make sure, and their doors were wide open so that I could see them from upstairs. I sat down to finish the movie while trying to process what had just happened, but when I sat down, I noticed that the TV had been shut off, even though I had left it on. When I turned it back on, there was just snow on the screen, and for the life of me, I couldn't get it to work again. That's when the talking downstairs started up again. Not only that, but this time, the baby started screaming bloody murder. This baby never woke up from naps and definitely wouldn't ever scream the way that it did that night. I have never in my life run down a staircase as fast as I did that night. I rushed toward the baby's bedroom, only to find the door closed. I ripped open the door and picked up the baby and rushed to pick up his sister. I took them both upstairs and held those kids for almost three hours before the parents came back home. The talking and sounds from downstairs came and went as I had the kids with me on the couch. I held them as close to me as I could and tried my best to keep them asleep. As the parents came home, I was too scared to walk downstairs to greet them. I couldn't be sure if it was actually them or not until they walked up the stairs and found me clutching their children. Obviously, they noticed I was upset and asked me what had happened. I honestly felt like I had lost my mind at that point, but I told them the story anyway. After I was finished, they told me that it wasn't the first time something like that had happened. Apparently, they hear the voices all the time at night. I was kind of surprised that they didn't even think to warn me ahead of time. They said they were sorry that this had happened to me, and the mom walked me home to my house. I slept with the lights on in my room for almost a month after that. Believe it or not, I did go back and I did babysit those kids again. And every once in a while, I would hear the sounds from downstairs. I babysit for my mom's friend a lot. He has three daughters, but I usually only babysit the youngest, who's five years old. Last weekend, I stayed at their house overnight. During dinner that night, we were talking while I was walking around and cleaning up. All of a sudden, she asks, why is his face like that? I asked who she was talking about because there was nobody else in the house. She says, the man in the chair. Obviously, I see nobody in the chair, so I say, I don't know, why don't you ask him yourself? And she responds, I don't want to, he scares me. I try to ask what he looks like, but she refuses to tell me. Then we finish eating and she never mentions him again. But she does keep trying to make excuses to not go to sleep which is really weird for her because she loves bedtime. After I get her to sleep, I took pictures around the kitchen just to see if anything would show up, but I got nothing. I've had paranormal experiences before, but never in their house that I know of. So maybe it's just a kid's creepy imagination, but she only watches things like Frozen and My Littlest Pony, so I don't think it's something she saw at least not on television, it still creeps me out. I was babysitting one night for a family friend about four years ago. I had put the kids to bed and crashed on the couch while waiting for my mom and the friend to get back from a night out. Randomly, I woke up, and I just remember being very confused about why I was even awake. That was, until I heard the front door close. A key thing to note here is the fact that the only sound was the door closing. There was no sound of it being locked, and this lock was very loud. 
I also didn't hear my mom or her friend, but I still assumed that it was them coming back. So I sat up, preparing to leave, until the lack of their voices really sank in. They are never quiet after a night out, especially because the friend always has some drinks. And I also noticed that there was only one set of footsteps I could hear. For a moment, I considered the possibility of it being the friend's husband coming home to grab something. He's a firefighter and was at the station for one of his 24-hour shifts. I could hear this person walking around the front room, then going to the table in there and shuffling through papers as if frantically searching for something. The more I listened though, the more it just didn't feel right. I pretty quickly dropped the idea of it being the husband and jumped to the next idea, which was that it was an intruder. Being around 15 at the time, I was in no way brave enough to confront any intruder that broke into the house. I managed to scoot along a wall leading to the front room before becoming completely paralyzed by fear. I ended up promising myself that I would keep my presence hidden until the person walked upstairs to the kids or back toward me. I could hear them pacing around a lot, papers and items being shuffled through. Eventually, I heard the footsteps start to come down the hall before turning into the bathroom, which was before they could reach me or the stairs. Only seconds after the footsteps walked into the bathroom, I heard the front door unlock this ties back into the beginning because it really stuck out that the door was never locked and I can remember every single sound from the second that I woke up. Immediately, I heard my mom and the friend talking loudly and part of me was relieved while the other part of me prepared to hear them screaming upon finding an intruder in the bathroom. The bathroom is way too small to hide in so they would have seen somebody there. Shockingly, they just walked straight past it, and my mom told me to get my stuff so we could go home. I was still listening the entire time, and the bathroom door never closed, and no further footsteps were ever heard. As I finally walked down the hall to the door, I scanned the bathroom. The door was wide open, the window was shut and too small to fit anyone but kids through, and there was nobody crouched in the darkness. There was absolutely nothing off about the house. No windows open on the first floor and nobody left between my mom coming back and us leaving. Nothing. I'm a skeptic. I like to think that this might have been an intruder, but I cannot think of any logical way that they could have hidden in that short minute it took for me to walk by, nor did they have an escape route. The friend never found an intruder or noticed any missing items. Nothing makes sense. All I know is that that night is vividly ingrained in my head, too vividly to be a dream, and I still get that feeling of something just not being right whenever I think about it. Back in 2012, I was a senior in high school. One time, I babysat the infant son of a couple who were close family friends. I put the baby down to bed early, probably eight o'clock or so. He slept upstairs while I chilled downstairs in the living room, watching TV with the baby monitor nearby. The parents had said they would be back about midnight. At around 11 o'clock, I heard the baby screaming through the baby monitor. And I don't mean crying, I mean screaming. I worked at a daycare all through high school, and even to this day, I have never heard a baby scream like that. It didn't sound like he was upset or crying for food or a diaper change. The scream that he made made the hairs on my arms and the back of my neck stand up. Even remembering it, it still does. It was like my instincts could pick up on some kind of primal terror within that scream. 
I ran up the stairs, opened the door of the baby's room, and turned the lights on. He was there, standing in the crib, holding himself up on the rail with one hand. His other hand was pointing at the closet, still screaming. I picked him up and he calmed down a bit as I patted him on the back. I brought him downstairs with me as his parents were going to be home within the hour. I didn't have the courage to check the closet. I'm not ashamed to say that it freaked me out because it was just me and this baby in the house. The parents arrived home around midnight as they had said. There was some confusion and frustration as to why the baby was still awake with me downstairs. When they questioned me about this, I told them what had happened. I thought that I would sound like an idiot, and I was kind of worried about how I would explain it leading up to their arrival. However, when I said what happened, the mother's expression dropped. She shook her head, and her eyes welled up, obviously distraught, and she took her son upstairs without a word. It's weird, because remember, these are family friends. We are all usually on good terms. The father apologized on her behalf and for what I had experienced. He shared that his wife had been seeing the ghost of a Civil War soldier standing at the foot of their bed. He had never seen it, but he knew that her fear was real and that they didn't have an explanation for what was going on. I never experienced anything paranormal myself that night. However, I have never seen anybody react with such palpable fear and distress for seemingly no reason ever since. The way the baby screamed, the way the mother's demeanor immediately changed when I told her what happened, are what still give me the creeps. About 10 years ago, when I was 16, I started babysitting for a family that lived in my neighborhood. They had a sweet seven-month-old baby girl that I would babysit every now and then, and two dogs that were also very sweet. Despite them having a nice, normal house in a nice neighborhood, I still got a really weird feeling whenever I was in their house, almost like I was being watched. It was like I could feel a presence there while I was there. Whenever I took care of the baby or their dogs, I would never want to spend longer there than I had to. One night while babysitting her, now about two-year-old, she asked to go down to their basement to play with Play-Doh. I said sure, and we went downstairs. I got a very weird feeling when we went down there, but I still got out the Play-Doh for her. We were playing for about two minutes before she came over to me and said she was scared. I asked her why she was scared, and she said, the man is scaring me. I said, what? Because I thought I had heard her wrong the first time, but she repeated again very clearly, the man is scaring me. She then asked to go upstairs and I said yes. She bolted and ran up the stairs and left me alone in the basement with whatever man this was I couldn't see, cleaning up the Play-Doh. About six months after that, the family asked me to care for the dogs while they were out of town, and I said yes. I ended up burning some sage and asking the spirit to leave the space. After that, I didn't feel the presence quite as strongly. It was to this day such a weird experience and I still have no explanation for why all that happened. I had a very strange babysitting experience the other night. Everything was normal until the kids were in bed. One of the kids kept running around, but finally they were down. And so I was just scrolling through random videos on Instagram to pass the time. I was watching one and I heard something. It was like a man or one of the boys pretending to have a deep voice was upstairs. It just said, no, 
or something like that in this weird, crowley voice. I was confused and a little spooked, but I brushed it off and sat on the couch to watch a movie. Their dog was walking around and growling at the windows that led to the backyard. That creeped me out too, but I tried to brush that off. I thought maybe the dog had seen a squirrel or something. At this point, it's about 10 p.m. The dog was laying on my lap and started growling and barking toward the kitchen. At this point, I was like, you better cut that out because who on earth wouldn't be creeped out by that? Later, I heard these incredibly light, whispery voices, like children. I wasn't completely sure if it was just the kids waking up and making noises, but it only lasted a moment after I noticed. I didn't even have time to go up and check. I noticed all these weird things, but I didn't really put them all together until later that night. I talked to my mom, and she told me that my sister and her friend had babysat there as well and they both had odd experiences. Bad vibes, the kid telling her she'd seen some things, and the kids actually addressing something that wasn't there. My mom didn't tell me before I went over so that I wouldn't be spooked, which I guess was good, because I got an independent witness of whatever happened without being influenced by the experiences of others. Anyway, I'll still go back to babysit. I'll just be prepared to throw hands with Casper if I have to, I guess. I've had a few experiences throughout my life, but this one tends to stand out. I was about 14 and I had been babysitting for a few couples for about three years already. Two of the couples were close friends and I would end up babysitting for both sets of their children. One had two and one had three children ranging from 18 months to 10 years old. This particular night, I asked a friend of mine to assist. So I do have a witness. The home we were in was in an older, beautiful, two-story home with a full basement in a nice part of Tulsa around Swan Lake. The kids got rowdy when bedtime was mentioned, which is why I had my friend. They were in an upstairs room, the baby's room, jumping and laughing, and all of a sudden we heard three incredibly loud bangs from near the window on the second floor. Upon hearing this, I called out and I told the kids that that was enough, having thought that it was one of them. It was then that I noticed that they were all frozen in their tracks, looking from the window to us. And one of them finally said, we didn't do it. No one had been by the window. It wasn't until a few years ago that I would mention this part when I told the story, because I really didn't want to believe what I saw when I looked out. But there were two red eyes looking into the room from outside. I grabbed the baby and we nearly ran over each other getting out of the room and downstairs. My friend and I ran into the kitchen and grabbed steak knives. We were young and panicked and we huddled in the living room. First, we heard a loud crash. Then we heard something with loud, heavy steps just pacing back and forth. The home had original hardwood floors, so it creaked. I had called my parents who were about 10 minutes away, no cell phones then, and I told them that there was someone in the house. My parents came and my dad went upstairs, my friend and I close behind. Of course, there was no one, but the weird thing we did notice was that the bedroom door to the right of the top stairs was open. We went in and the closet door was open and there was a curtain which was down, which had covered a very small window, about 18 by 12 inches, and that window was open. There were no trees, no ladders, no gables, no way to access this back side of the house upstairs, especially through that window. When the parents came home, we had told them what happened, 
and I proceeded to mention that I probably would not be comfortable babysitting there again. The next morning, my mom mentioned that she had heard about a 15-year-old boy who had lived with his stepmother. He had hung himself in that house, but she didn't want to tell me because she didn't want me to be scared or imagine things. Thanks, Mom. Having heard this, it made me remember being in this house during previous times that I had babysat and other situations that occurred. One, the home had window units, and in the summertime, I found that there was always a cool breeze from the bottom to the top stair. I would always sit there and do my homework after the kids went to bed. At the top and bottom of the stairs, though, at least once you pass those points, it would be really hot and humid. Two, the downstairs had the living room back to a wall and stairs to the kitchen. I would sit on a settee with my back to the stairs, doing my homework, and suddenly feel somebody behind me. It always felt like it was a male presence, and I thought it was the father trying to sneak up and surprise me. I mean, I could hear his breathing and all. I would steel myself so that I wouldn't jump when he tried to surprise me, but then nothing would happen, and I would jerk around and see that nobody was there. Then I would just turn on the TV or something to occupy my mind, being a bit creeped out. Number three. This home has sold several times over the years. One time when I had been visiting town several years later, I had moved out of state, there was a midnight garage sale. I had to stop and talk to the current owners. Either them or the next owners ended up building a tall brick fence around the property, seemingly due to others knowing about this house and wanting to come and visit the haunted house. Finally, during another visit with an old boyfriend, we drove by and they were having an open house for sale again. We stopped and we were invited to go through. The home had been completely remodeled, beautiful with a decked out full basement. While we were ascending the stairs to the second floor, I was explaining to the agent and my friend that during the time that I had babysat in the home and during several visits thereafter, the weirdest thing was that there was approximately six locks on the attic door from the hallway, and I had never gone into the attic, because obviously. Right as I finished my story, we looked up, and even after all the different renovations of the home, the locks were still on that attic door. Mind you, at this time, it had been at least 20 years since I had babysat there. Makes me wonder what they realized they needed to keep in all these years. I did finally open the door. The hair was straight up on my neck. There were about five steps and plywood covering the rest. I opened the boards and it was just a room with some plywood on the floor, not really built out at all, but the energy was thick. I don't exactly know what happened in that home other than the one incident but it has stayed with me throughout the years. I felt for many years that there was something looking out at me every time I passed that home. The front faced a busy street and was near to the home that I was raised in and still visited. I still drive by every time I'm in town and I still feel like there's something there. As we speak, I am babysitting two little girls in an old New England manor. The two girls are upstairs in bed, and I have both baby monitors. The oldest is already asleep. The youngest is whispering. I hear her say, what? Why? Why? And then I hear, always turns back into the dog. Pretty sure the dog is laying at my feet somebody come keep me company. Update. The parents finally came home. I was called pretty unexpectedly to come babysit, which is unusual for this usually very well-planned family. They were in a rush to leave and told me it would only be for a couple of hours, 
turned out to be five. That made me nervous right there. They returned, saying that they were in a rush because the dad had been bitten on the chest and they needed to go to the hospital without stressing anybody out. Doctors were unsure and gave him antibiotics. Earlier today, the microwave went on the fritz and started melting everything on the outside of the microwave. They had me check on it all night. Now that I'm seriously thinking about all of these things, I wonder if they all add up to something, or if I'm just paranoid. In January, when I babysat them last, I fell at the bottom of the stairs. I stood up and I fell again and sprained my ankle pretty badly. I chalked it up to black ice. But of course, now I'm second guessing that too. There was blood spattered on the youngest girl's bed sheets. She said she had three nosebleeds in one week. Maybe this could all be unrelated, but I'm starting to think that something pretty malicious is going on there. But what do I know? I'm just the babysitter. This is a story that happened to me years ago that I have never really talked much about. I thought it might be interesting to tell though. When I was a teenager, I made money by babysitting. On this particular night, I was working at a house a few minutes away from my home, so I had been able to work later than usual. The family had two little girls that I was watching, around four and seven years old. To give a bit of background on what the home looked like, the house had two floors and two staircases that led to the upstairs. One set was off the kitchen, and the other was in the foyer. This home had an alarm system that would beep three times when any door was opened, although it was not the type that would say which door. I was sitting in the kitchen at around 11 p.m. and just coloring to pass the time at the kids' table. The parents had said that they would be home between 11.30 and 12. I was starting to get antsy to go home. It was nearing midnight when I heard the alarm for the door, and I got up, expecting to see the parents coming in. When they didn't, I just went back to what I was doing. About 15 minutes later, it went off again. This time, I felt a little creeped out, so I went around checking all the doors which I found to be shut tight and locked. I had sat back down, figuring that there must be some kind of glitch with the system. Within about a minute, the door alarm went off twice, as if two doors had been opened in quick succession. And as I stood up, I heard a little girl screaming bloody murder. I raced up the stairs into the girl's shared room and found them both sleeping soundly. I checked all the nooks and crannies of their room, and I remember feeling that the only thing that seemed different was that the book that I had read them was on the floor instead of in the bookshelf. I ended up checking the stairs and the other rooms, as I felt pretty unsure of the girl's safety, but I found nothing, and all the doors were still locked. I ended up sitting back down in the kitchen, feeling stupid, and not long after, the alarm beeped once, really loudly, which I had not heard before, and the panel did not seem to give an explanation for that. After that, everything stopped, and the parents came home not long after. I managed to convince myself at the time that I had just imagined things, but after all this time, I can still remember the fearful scream really clearly. Nothing too exciting, I guess. Just something that I have never been able to forget. A couple of years ago, I babysat for a family friend. She and her husband lived with their two kids a girl about seven who we'll call Kay, and a boy about 12 who we can call Jay. 
I babysat these kids so much that we became very close, brother and sister type deal. They weren't difficult kids. They had a hard home life because their parents were borderline abusive, but they were still good kids. I tried my best to be a positive adult. I was only 18 or 19 during this experience. The family moved around a lot. I've known them now for over six years and they have moved every single year. This experience happened in 2015. I was halfway through my senior year when the family moved into this house. It was really nice. It had just been built in 2013 or something like that. It was a nice neighborhood, but rent was really low. The mother often bragged about the steal of a deal she got for the house. To put it in perspective, the average rent in this area is about $1,200 a month just for an apartment. These guys got a whole two-story house, three beds, four baths, freshly built in a nice neighborhood for $650 a month. I thought it was weird and asked if there was anything wrong with the home, to which she replied that the inspection had come back clear. I didn't think much about it beyond that. I started babysitting, and I immediately felt something was off. I have anxiety, so going to new places really puts me in a funk. So I just figured that's what it was, at first. The way the home is set up is important. On the bottom floor, they had a living room, a dining area, and a kitchen with some other rooms. I spent most of my time in the living room, working on things for school while the kids were upstairs playing games or hanging out with friends. While you're in the living room, there's a wall that blocks you from seeing the stairs. Upstairs, there are bedrooms. Immediately off the stairs and above the living room is the parents' room, which was off limits to the kids. Then there was a loft area that looked down over the front door to make a grand foyer feeling. There's a light that can be on, which can be seen from downstairs because of the loft. Then the kids' bedrooms were down the hall. So nothing really happened at first that was too mind-boggling. Little noises here and there, knocks on the walls, things being misplaced, lights flickering, but nothing that made me think ghosts. I figured they got what they paid for and my memory was garbage. After a couple of months, things started to pick up and I could no longer blame it on a bad memory or a faulty electrical system. The kids, who were usually very sweet and kind to each other, started becoming noticeably more snappy to everyone, especially Jay. He complained about having nightmares, about somebody standing in his doorway watching him. His parents wouldn't listen though. Their behavior grew even worse as time went on. It was a weekend, and the parents were going to be gone for a while. The kids were upstairs just doing their thing. I was downstairs in the living room, looking at pizza to order for lunch. Out of nowhere, I hear really loud footsteps coming from above me in the parents' bedroom, thunderous even. Thinking that it was the kids being little dingus meats, I immediately headed upstairs to tell them to get out. But I was greeted with the two kids standing in their doorways, staring at the closed door to their parents' room. The footsteps and bangs were still going on inside. At this point, I thought it was an intruder. I instructed the kids to get into their rooms and lock their doors, and I called emergency and explained the situation. As I stayed on the phone, the footsteps continued to walk around the room. I could hear them moving in different locations. Two officers arrived, so I grabbed the kids and we waited outside. The banging still went on as one of the officers escorted us out. They came out empty-handed and said that there was nothing there and that there may have been something with the door because the banging stopped as soon as they opened it. I had felt the shaking of the floor moving around the room, so I knew that it wasn't a door, but I guess in my denial I ignored it. I took the kids out for ice cream and tried not to think about it. Another time, the kids and I were sitting in the dining area eating dinner. It was just us three in the house. From the dining area, you could see the light upstairs was on, and it cast a shadow onto the floor. I was making a joke about how I'm the only one who knows how to turn a light off around here, and that's when I saw a shadow of a hand from upstairs on the front door. 
And I think that's when it really started settling down with me, that the house was haunted. The kids didn't see it, and I didn't tell them. I figured it would just add stress that they really didn't need. I told the parents that night when they came home, but they brushed me off, saying they've never experienced anything at all. This continued on for a while. I would experience something, the kids would, but the parents wouldn't believe any of us. It was summer, just after I graduated high school. I remember it vividly because I was awake, reading articles about a huge thing that happened in my town. That's when the banging from upstairs started happening. I was used to it at this point, but what I was not used to was the banging footsteps coming down the stairs. These steps were methodical and menacing. I felt terrible energy in the room and it was cold, despite it being in the middle of summer in the south. I counted the seconds between steps and it was five, every single time. I called out to the kids and told them to stop joking around, but I knew it wasn't them. I was terrified. The footsteps stopped at the bottom of the stairs and I couldn't see who was there. Then I saw an apparition of a little girl. She had brunette hair and a red dress. She looked innocent enough, but the energy in the room was so heavy I almost threw up. She looked at me, and I looked at her, and she didn't move. I thought I was hallucinating, so I started to rub my eyes. But when I finished rubbing them, she was still there, right in front of me. No longer at the foot of the stairs. I never heard her move. In that situation, I couldn't move or do anything. My mind just went to kid brain, and I hid under the blanket I was using. I called the parents crying and told them to come back immediately. When they came, the energy in the room lightened, and I finally came out from under the blanket. She was gone. They asked what was wrong and what happened, and I told them, but of course it didn't matter, because they wouldn't believe me. I then informed them that they needed to find another babysitter, because I would not be returning. I still wonder about the kids. I hope they ended up okay. They moved out of that house at the end of the year, but I'm not sure if what I saw was attached to them or not. I'm still not sure what I saw. Anyway, I still have nightmares about the girl, and it's still a really frightening event for me. Last summer, my family of four and I were backpacking and camping near a river. It was a remote canyon in a very wild area, and it was quite blissful, until we woke up around two o'clock in the morning to a very distressing sound. We were sleeping in our hammocks very close to the river, and about 40 feet behind us was a tall canyon wall. The sound made me think of an injured animal that was very cat-like. It was coming from behind us toward the wall of the canyon. It was regular. It occurred like clockwork every 15 to 20 seconds. We thought this was unusual. We shined flashlights and spoke very loudly in hopes of frightening whatever it was away from us. There was no moon out and we could see very little but shining our flashlights around revealed nothing as well. Still, it sounded so very close. Our efforts did not work at all, and it seemed relentless and completely unfazed by us in every way. I worried that it was rabid or hurt. At one point, I heard it near the river, on the other side of us, and I was incredibly confused as to how it was able to move around without us hearing it. I sat on the edge of my hammock until dawn, with my knife in my hand, waiting for a wild or sick animal to come out of the bushes at any moment, and having to fight for our lives. Fortunately, that didn't happen. Finally, around dawn, the sounds got less frequent, and eventually they stopped. After hiking out, we googled many different animal sounds. The closest we could find to what we had heard was a mountain lion mating call. There definitely were lions in that area, so I still believe that that's what we heard. 
I'm still really confused, though, as to why it stayed so very close to us, and why it wasn't scared away like most animals would be. I'm also confused as to how it got from one side to the other without us detecting it. We've seen black bear in this area many times, and they've always run in the other direction when seeing humans, and cats are even more elusive. So, regardless of what happened, it was very strange behavior, and it still gives me the creeps to this day. I am a 27-year-old female, and I went backpacking alone over the recent long weekend, which was 10 out of 10 beautiful. The second night I camped at a beautiful high elevation lake, which could also be accessed by a short one mile trail. So there were a few other campers and several people who were just day hiking or fishing. It was late afternoon and I was sitting around my camp reading when a guy in his mid twenties walked by carrying a fishing pole and a small cooler. I didn't think much of it, but five to 10 minutes later, he doubled back and came and said hello. I said hi and went back to reading, but then without warning, he sat down on a stump next to me. I was completely taken aback at this invasion of my space. He started asking me questions that were really just statements, but in a creepy amused tone, like, so you're just reading? And then looked behind me and noticed my tent and said, oh, you're staying the night here alone, huh? I didn't say anything in response to this in particular, but it was obvious that I was. It's hard to explain, but his vibe was just really off. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't even really form words or tell him that I was trying to be alone and get him to leave me alone. I was honestly paralyzed. His eyes were so dead and dark and they just drilled into me. I just responded with things like, uh huh, or yep, or something like that and tried to pretend that I was still reading. Without warning, he pulls out and cracks open a beer and lights a cigarette and just starts blowing the smoke at me. At this point, I am so uncomfortable and just not responding. Soon, another hiker wandered by and he strikes up a conversation with him. And I took the opportunity to grab my water filter and bladder and pretend that I needed to get water. I went to the shore and filtered some water super slowly and I saw him walk away to go sit with the new guy, which made me pretty relieved, except that he kept looking in my direction. I came back eventually and got inside my tent, and for about 20 minutes, everything was fine. I had the rain fly pulled back and was just watching the sunset and loosely organizing my things. When he popped out from behind my tent and stood maybe one foot from my door, looking down at me, he didn't say anything, but he just started laughing this really creepily fake laugh. I said, what? And his response was, this is just really funny. I literally felt sick to my stomach. And I finally responded with something like, I'm taking a nap now, so you have a good night. He laughed again, but luckily he left. Later, I saw him still wandering around the camp with no real purpose, still looking in my direction often. I had no service, but I wrote down his last name, at least what was written on his cooler, and where he said he was from while talking to the other hiker in my notes app, just in case, and I slept with my pocket knife close. I debated leaving camp that night, but I ended up staying and just leaving super early in the morning in case he came back. Normally while backpacking, I think the worst thing that could happen is that I might run into a bear or sprain an ankle, and maybe this seems not as bad as you're reading this. But in the moment, face to face, this truly was the most unsettling experience I've ever had in the backcountry. I'm sure I'll be back out soon, 
but hopefully somewhere far away from this dude. About 10 to 15 years ago, a buddy of mine and I were camping in the Wainushi area of the Olympic National Forest, south of Olympic National Park. We'd found a remote site that was fairly isolated, about as far into the wilderness as you could go and still drive a vehicle. My buddy and I camped out about once a month back in those days. We liked to go around looking for Bigfoot evidence. Our second night there, we were sitting at the campfire, and I thought I heard voices. I heard faint singing voices, mostly higher ones in the upper registers, like a choir of women. It was faint, but my buddy didn't hear it. I figured it was just wind playing tricks on my ears, not uncommon when out in the woods. However, I kept hearing it every few minutes, and it got louder. Finally, my friend heard it too, and we gathered up the courage to find the source. We did a circle search pattern and found out that it was coming from down the road. We walked down the road to the nearest dispersed campsite, which was about 300 yards away, and we found a church group of about 10 to 12 teenage kids with a couple of adults that were singing church hymns. They had come in a small church van during the day while we were out hiking and we just didn't realize they'd come in. We just waved high and walked by, relieved to find the source of the angelic choir in the woods. But for a few minutes during our search, I really was weirded out. You usually don't hear angelic singing in the middle of the wilderness. Still, for a few minutes, it was a pretty creepy thing. We have a cabin that is remote. It's where I stay for work. I'm always told not to go out alone for safety reasons because it's so remote. Things can go wrong quickly and help is very far away. This trip, I went alone as I needed to get work done there. I also needed time to get away from the city life. Getting out into the wild is a great way to reset and I needed that. My trip ended up taking a long time I got into camp at about 1.30 in the morning. I stopped the truck, put on my headlamp, and went straight to the warehouse to get the generator going. I connected the power and the cabin lights up. There was a ton of snowfall, so I do my usual inspection just to see if I can spot any tracks around the cabin. Wolves, moose, humans, whatever. And I find nothing. I head into the cabin light a fire and cook myself a very late meal. As it is remote, there isn't any cell service, but I did download some movies on my phone to keep me occupied because it helps me fall asleep. I did eventually fall asleep, but at about 2.30 in the morning, I decided to add more logs to the fire to make sure that it would last me through the cold winter night. As I was doing this, I noticed that I heard someone or something walking on the deck toward the front door. You know that sound when snow is crushed under a boot? That's what I was hearing. I thought, weird, I haven't heard a vehicle pull in or anything. So I just listened to make sure that I was hearing this correctly. Then I was 100% positive that there was somebody outside. I get up from the chair where I was sitting and immediately look out the window. Then I move to the front door and unlock it. I look toward where I was hearing these footsteps and I call out, but there's nothing. I thought to myself, well, whatever it is, it wants fear and there's no way I'm giving it that. So I close the door and lock it just to be sure. I stayed up for a little while longer to listen, but nothing. I thought to myself, you know, maybe it's a Martin. They're common critters around these parts and I fell back asleep. The next morning I checked for tracks, and there were prints. 
There were some, but I couldn't confirm if they were mine or not. I had forgotten to check the moment that I got up, and I had walked by there a few times that morning to use the bathroom. I've gone back there with company, as I usually do. I stay up a little later than everyone else to listen for those footsteps, but I had never heard them again. Where I'm from, legend states that when you're alone in the wilderness, something will play tricks on you, and you're not supposed to respond, because its goal is to harm you. Recently, I thought about a little story that happened when I worked at a summer camp in West Virginia. I'm not from West Virginia, and at the time I didn't know anything about the stories and things that have happened in the woods there. I came to know about these things thanks to social media after leaving that summer job. At the time, I thought what happened to me was just my imagination, or being vigilant about my surroundings. But now I'm not so sure. The summer camp I worked at had employee campgrounds. We all slept in tents. Each tent had two people, and they were placed near a pond. My tent was near the tree line, to a little piece of woods. You can see deer and bear every once in a while, and I constantly worried about having encounters with bears at night. This night, after having some drinks with my coworkers at a local bar, I was pretty spooked about the campgrounds, but I couldn't figure out why. It felt heavy to walk through the tents. I went into my tent to get my toothbrush so I could get ready for bed. I walked to the bathroom, washed my face, and brushed my teeth. As I'm walking back to my tent, I dropped my toothbrush. Something made me look around. I felt like I was being watched. I looked and nobody was outside. I noticed that no one was in the bathroom either. But I also didn't hear crickets or nocturnal animals that you would hear every single night. It was totally silent. I picked up my toothbrush and kept walking to my tent. As I pulled up the zipper, I felt this piercing stare coming from the tree line. It felt big, dark, and heavy. I froze and looked straight at it but I couldn't see anything. Even so, I knew I had locked eyes with something. My body just told me to get into my tent and close up for the night. When I got inside, I put all my things away and changed into my sleeping clothes. I still felt whatever that was staring at me from outside the tent. The feeling was stronger though, so I decided to try to ignore it and go to bed. Later on that summer, I had a doe with twin fawns just hanging out in front of my tent. That doe was staring me down hard and would not let me inside my tent. I looked for my friend at camp and we tried to make her run away, but nothing would make her budge. We decided to go out for dinner and when we came back, the doe and her twins were in front of her tent, not letting us go inside. I also visited an old Civil War burial ground on camp. The air was so heavy, no birds were chirping. There was just this eerie silence. There were no living trees. The tree line that surrounded the burial grounds gave it a perfect circle. Nothing in that circle was alive or thriving. It just felt horrible there. I didn't even know we had gotten to the burial grounds. But I told my friend, we must be there already, because it feels like death. Sure enough, I started to look down, and that's when I saw the headstones. My experiences there were strange, but I enjoyed every bit of it. West Virginia is a magical place. Spooky, but magical. I live in New Hampshire, in the southern suburban area. When I was younger, and currently, I lived in a couple of places because of divorce. 
I'll start off with my mom's house. There were these woods that were behind my mom's house that we owned. We owned a pine-dominated acre, but the whole woods were about 20 acres. You could always see civilization from it. Either the suburban house rose or a street on the other side that had no houses on the sides. These woods always felt warm to me, and I loved being in them. It was basically a third parent to me. However, on the other side of the street was another forest, full of 10 to 20 year old oaks and birches. One day, when I was maybe nine or 10, I was playing in the nice woods, and I had explored the whole 20 acres of them. So I decided to check out the other woods on the other side of the street. The road was flanked on both sides by forests, and there was a nursing home down the street. I crossed the street, and the moment I entered this forest, my mind was telling me to get out. I had a sensation of being watched. However, I have always been curious, so I pushed deeper until I came to a circular, thinner part of the forest, not a clearing, where there was a pile of trash ahead of me. It wasn't like drug paraphernalia, but old food and trashed clothing. Now my inner voice was screaming to get out of there, so I ran back through the woods as fast as I could until I reached the road. I went back into the nice woods and I felt fine. About four or five years later, I was kind of bored with the woods behind my house, so I wanted to check out the other forest again. I go back, now with a knife in my holster, to explore. I had my hand on my knife the whole time. I had the being watched and get out feelings again. I never found the thinned part, but I did find shoes. Dozens of old, rotting shoes. There was also a camping stove, an old propane can, food trash, and a camping pot. I picked it up and took it home since I needed a cooking pot for camping and I actually still have it. The part that actually scared me though were the shoes. All kinds of them. Nice shoes, little shoes, women's running shoes, baby shoes, all at varying ages and states of decay. I was freaked out, but I kept on pushing. I got to this 35 degree embankment which I climbed and found a residential area above it. There was a thick fence with no gate, and the other houses didn't have a gate either. The trash and shoes were too deep into the forest to be thrown in by uncaring homeowners. I finally decided to leave. I was super scared by the time I got out of the forest, and I was, and still am, a very emotionally stoic person. However, the worst experience I had was at my dad's house. This was more of his neighborhood. It was a very tightly packed neighborhood, and it was surrounded by thin forests. Small forests of huge pines separated houses. It was in a city, but every now and then I would see a moose or a deer. Moose are extremely rare down here. So one day I was walking my dog during dusk. It was almost total night, and the street lamps were on. I got close to a turn in my walking path, with this pine and oak forest. And I thought I spotted something in the forest, and froze from terror. My gut wrenched in the most horrible, despicable feeling ever. I felt like I was just told the worst news of my life. It looked like a deer standing up, not a wendigo. It had a fat white belly and brown fur on its back. It was staring right at me. I originally saw its belly, but then when I looked up at its face, I couldn't make it out. I have good eyesight and I should have been able to see it, but it was like my central vision had suddenly been switched to peripheral. It just blended in with the forest. I could see the body, but not the head. Then it fell to the ground got on all fours, turned, and ran in the direction of a fence. On the other side of the fence is a dump. The forest it was in is only about 50 feet by 50 feet. It must have jumped about the six foot chain link fence to get in and out. My dog, a hound who's normally smelling the pizza car 30 seconds before it arrives, noticed nothing. 
I could hear it run away, and the dog perked up and looked at it. But it never saw it up until then. I immediately turned around. To this day, those are my two creepiest backwoods experiences. I live fairly remotely in the New Hampshire woods, at the edge of the Great North Woods, and there are forests surrounding my house. I spent most of my childhood growing up in the woods, and I've never had an issue exploring, either on foot or on horseback. And for the most part, I've had a good understanding and a healthy respect of and for the animals that live in the woods out here. I don't know when I started noticing it, but over the years, I've picked up on the fact that some nights throughout the year, the woods feel unwelcoming. I don't know how to describe it other than I shouldn't be out there. And it feels like the woods become an entirely different place than what they usually are. One of the things that I've noticed most predominantly during the unwelcoming nights is that the wildlife seems to disappear or act differently. For example, there have always been coyotes where I live, and I could always hear them howling all year round, except on those nights. I've also noticed that the wild ducks, who typically live at the pond at my house, will disappear the day before or on one of the unwelcoming nights. It seems to me like it's similar to advice I've heard that said, if you don't hear any birds or animals in the woods, there's a reason that they're being quiet, and you shouldn't be there. Years ago, I had an experience with what I believe to be a not deer in the area. So I have experience with weird things, and I know that there are weird things going on in the area, as it's pretty typical for the Appalachians. The feeling that I get on unwelcoming nights in the woods, though, is similar to the eerie feeling that I've had when experiencing cryptid or paranormal phenomena. I'm just wondering if anybody else has experienced anything similar, or has any ideas about what makes these unwelcoming nights. I'm a wilderness survival instructor and security contractor. A couple of days ago, a student of mine and good friend who I had taken out into the woods before told me that his dad just got 150 acres of land in a secluded, mountainous part of my state. It had a large amount of forest on it that hadn't been explored yet, as his dad was only building something for his horses that took up about 100 yards of the property and his horses were free to roam at the moment. He said that his dad got an insane deal on the property. My friend is now a dad of three, and I know he doesn't get out into the woods that often, so I agreed to go with him because it seemed really fun, and I can imagine that he needs a getaway every now and then. We are both indigenous, into cars, into wilderness survival and all sorts of stuff, so we never run out of anything to talk about in the woods. His dad, however, told us that he didn't want anybody exploring the woods unless we had a gun. He said it was because he saw coyotes. Now, we're all indigenous here. We were raised in the same state. Coyotes don't actually attack people, really. My friend, who we'll call RC, also told me that a while back, when he was first at the property, he saw movement in the tree lines that was roughly human size and shape but he couldn't really tell since his eyesight isn't that good. I brought my AR and a small flint napping kit just for the fun of it, and we set off onto the property. We explored a lot of the rolling fields, creeks, multiple natural springs and ponds. Everything felt normal. It was beautiful landscape. Eventually, we decided to get to the forested part of the property as it hadn't been explored yet. As soon as we entered the tree line, the entire mood shifted. The forest had an ambiance of its own, 
very similar to the woods in the movie The Ritual. The woods were gray and dead silent, save for the occasional creaking of tall, tired cedar trees. There was a very small stream running through the center of it, with sand that was black. It felt like we were surrounded, watched from all sides. It didn't take long before a very putrid stench hit our nostrils. It was the odor of rotting flesh. We decided to follow the smell, and we found the remains of three to four cows. We examined the exposed skulls, and we couldn't find any bullet holes. It didn't appear to me that these cows had been put down. Something killed them, though, and their bones were spread over about 30 yards. There were large indentations in the dirt all around them that were very vague in their shapes. We decided to press on into the woods. Now, we were accompanied by only silence, the putrid odor of death, and the sound of our own heartbeats. We kept stopping at the stream as I noticed several different types of tracks, large coyote tracks and something else that was large but intentionally avoided the sand, it seemed. We pressed on into the woods until we started to find trees that had been bent over and pinned behind other trees while they were still alive, something that could never, ever happen naturally. We hiked on and found what I can only describe as a tool made of bone lying on the ground. It was extremely crude, but it looked like some kind of scooping tool or knife. It was disturbing because although it looked primitive, it looked more primitive than a person would make, but an intentionally shaped tool nonetheless. We hiked on until we found a clearing with a pond that had more large oval tracks surrounding it. On the other side of the pond, we found a very strange little tree structure. It was an A-frame, had rocks placed up against it, but it wasn't that sturdy, and the rocks were very peculiarly placed. We found no sign of any campfires around it. We found no camping trash. This isn't exactly a place that you could hike to from a house. It was getting dark, so we decided we should head back. I had a flashlight on my AR, but I didn't want to rely on that, in the dark, with something that kills cows and makes tools out of their bones somewhere behind us. We made our way out of the forest and back to where the trucks were parked, just in time before it got too dark to see. As we were leaving, we saw something on top of one of the hills that we couldn't identify, but we didn't stick around to find out what it was. It's worth mentioning that the previous owner began construction of something on the property, abruptly halted that construction, and left. In the early 90s, my parents sent me to a YMCA summer camp in the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It was located on the shores of a series of man-made lakes in the Medford Lakes, so not exactly backwoods. We all knew the stories of the Jersey Devil, but the camp had a few of its own ghost stories. The White Lady, or Lady in White, said to have jumped off a bridge on her wedding day, and Hatchet Harry an axe-wielding maniac who got kids who wandered into the woods. Both stories, I assume, were to keep kids from wandering off. What I encountered was neither of those. I woke up in the middle of the night in my bunk, hearing some rustling in the bushes. The cabins were basically a half wall, with screened windows all around save for the back wall. There were eight bunk beds, four on each side, you could lay in your bunk and look right out the windows. It really sucked when it rained because there were no shutters to close. I had heard this rustling, so I grabbed my flashlight and shined it into the bushes across from the front of the cabin, sweeping from bottom to top. There was nothing else in that direction, save for woods, as our cabin group was right on the edge of the camp. I didn't see anything out there, so I put my flashlight out and got ready to settle back in. But then, this light appeared. It was this bluish-white light, and it flickered slightly, kind of like a firefly. 
The light slowly followed the same path that my flashlight had traced, bottom to top, and then disappeared. It scared the crap out of me, but I didn't bother to wake my grouchy counselor. She wouldn't have believed me anyway, since I was already seen as a troublemaker. So I just smushed down into my sleeping bag and tried to get back to sleep. I never saw it again after that. My best guess is that it was some kind of firefly that thought my flashlight was a prospective mate. Although the fireflies in the area usually had a greenish hue. In any case, it was definitely odd. In the summer of 2012, I took a job as an expedition canoe guide on the Boundary Waters. It was in northern Minnesota, southern Ontario. This is a massive wilderness area of lakes and land. I was working for the Boy Scouts, and we were based on Moose Lake, on the U.S. side. My job was to facilitate a fun and safe multi-day trip, anywhere from 7 to 12 days out. Most of that summer was typical, but one expedition in particular still haunts me, as a result of what happened to us over the course of a few days. Here's the account in full. My crew was on the younger side. There were nine of us in total, the maximum allowed in a group per our permit. There were six scouts, two adult advisors or scoutmasters, and myself. They had wanted to do a 200 miler, but didn't have the physical ability, so we had to amend our route. They were bummed out, so I decided to take them to a waterfall called Eddy Falls. It's pretty flat up there, so a waterfall is somewhat rare, but that decision would end up putting us in the path of something. We visited the falls and camped near to it. That evening, I had the boys working on camp setup while the advisors worked on fire for dinner. I was collecting firewood in a big tangle of downed trees, brush, and bramble. I could faintly hear the falls off to my left, when out of nowhere, I hear the most unearthly scream or roar I've ever heard. It stopped me dead in my tracks and I was frozen. The second scream was closer and the third was closer still. I couldn't see anything due to the thickness of the brush, but whatever this was, it was coming directly at me. By the fourth scream, I could feel it in my chest. I got really nauseated and involuntarily, I barked at it. I've never before or since heard that sound come out of my body. The fifth scream almost physically hurt, but it snapped me back to reality and I ran back to camp. My crew had heard it too, but what was I supposed to tell them? I claimed that it was a boar. There are no boar up there, and the advisors knew that I was lying, but they didn't call my bluff. After dinner, they went to their tents, and I retired to my hammock, about 50 yards from camp. As a rule, I always set my hammock at head height, so about six feet up. I would use a tarp over my body and head to keep the morning dew off and the morning mosquitoes at bay. But the tarp wasn't strung up. That's important. It was just loosely over me. It must have been around three to four in the morning when I was awakened by what sounded to me like a woman sobbing. Not an outright cry, but a sob. At the same time, I'm hearing something walking through the thick brush down past my feet. So I listen, totally still and quiet, as it crosses into camp. I could hear the change from brush to granite rock but could still hear its heavy footfalls as it walked right through camp and on toward me. At this point, the tarp is still over my head, so I can't see a thing, and I don't know what to do. In no time, it was standing right next to me. I could hear the breathing, loud and congested sounding. I could smell the musk. I could feel its enormous presence only inches from my body, just standing there. Time to make a decision. 
I suddenly threw the tarp off my head, and as I did this, my left hand touched the thing in the chest. It was dark, but I could make out briefly a very large upright figure. The hair on it was long and coarse. The musculature was impressive. Bodybuilder status pectoral is what I touched. It all happened in a second, and as soon as my hand made contact, it bolted back into the brush with immense speed for such thick debris. By the time I got my headlamp on, it was gone. My crew had slept through it all, so I read until the sun came up and decided not to mention it. The next day we moved on a few miles toward base camp and camped on a small island. Campsites on the U.S. side are designated by a fire pit and a grumper, which is a fiberglass toilet over a deep hole. We were just arriving and it was evening. One of the adult advisors needed to visit the grumper, so he walked toward it. About two minutes later, we heard him yelling and he came running back to camp, still pulling his pants up. He said that he had just seen a gorilla run right in front of him. I asked if maybe it was a bear, and he said absolutely not, that he'd hunted bear for years and it was no bear. It was a monkey, and it was about nine feet tall. At this height estimate, I'm imagined being back in my hammock. If I touched the chest, and I was about six feet off the ground, that puts the head close to nine feet up. Was it stalking us? Was there more than one? The boys are now scared. Time to mitigate. I suggest a night paddle. No one's sleeping anymore anyway, so we pack back up and set out at around 8 p.m. and paddled by headlamp for several miles. My plan was to get back onto Moose Lake and camp very near to base so we could be the first crew off water the following day. Moose Lake is connected to Newfound Lake by a small pinch and a channel of water that's not very deep or wide. There are dark woods on both sides. We were right in the middle of the pinch when a rock the size of a basketball came flying out of the woods on the right side and narrowly missed the bow of the canoe that I was steering. There's no cliff there. This thing was forcefully thrown at us from the tree line. At this, we paddled like hell. We paddled to the center of Moose Lake, tied all three canoes together, and sat out there all night. With the sunrise, we paddled to base camp and ended our expedition. They didn't want to talk about what happened, and I was okay with that. They left for Oklahoma the next day. After they left, I went to work a shift in the canoe yard helping crews offload. My buddy Justin got back that day from a trip in the same area that we'd been in, Bear Loop. And as I was helping him put a boat on the rack, I noticed he had a distant look, almost a thousand yard stare. I asked how his trip went, and he said it was all good until they hit Knife Lake or Newfound Lake. He said that they were being messed with for two nights on Knife, and then had a rock thrown at them in the Newfound Pinch. Sure enough, for a solid two weeks after that, crews kept coming back from that area with very similar stories. One night, there was a crowd of us guides in the staff lodge swapping trail stories, and these encounters came up, one after another. Screams, rocks, sightings of apes. Then from the back corner of the room, I hear a chuckle. It's one of the old veteran guides who'd been there for over a decade. All he said was, it's about time somebody else seen one. I asked how long he'd known they were there. He said he's been encountering them for 10 years. Then he said, they talk to me. This shocked me. Like a language? I asked. Nah, they communicate telepathically. The less you acknowledge them, the less they'll bother you, but they can read you. And they like it when you're afraid. It's a game to them. What happened out there is still a big question in my mind. I've always been open to the idea of Sasquatch. Their existence was never a huge stretch for me. But what really sticks with me 
is the way that veteran guide spoke of their intelligence and parapsychological abilities, that they can read human emotion as clear as pages in a book, that they know our species better than we know ourselves. It was summer in Canada, and I, along with two of my friends, had planned to spend a few days camping. We actually found a small cabin that was available at this small cabin grounds for cheap. It was a large piece of forested land by a lake, with a bunch of cabins scattered around, and you could rent them for however long you wanted. We booked the place last minute and decided to go there instead of camping. If you've ever been to Northern Canada, then you know how barren the place is with a man-made structure every couple of hundred kilometers and forest all around. Three hours later when we arrived, it was maybe 4 p.m. We met with the owner who lived in a distant larger cabin nearby. After talking and paying for our stay, we went off to the cabin. The cabin was small, with a stream leading up to a larger lake right beside it, and a small fire pit out front. There was dense forest pretty much all around us. Being that far out, we had little to no service. We took advantage of the daylight and took out some kayaks, which came with the cabin, and explored our surroundings. As it got dark, we set up a small campfire in front of the cabin in the fire pit, and we were just talking. A massive thunderstorm snuck up on us, and soon it started to rain. Since it was raining, we didn't really bother to put the fire out, since it was already basically out by itself given the rain. We went inside and got ready for bed. The beds were all in the same room, so we just talked for the most part since we couldn't fall asleep, with the thunder in the distance and the rain pattering on the window of the cabin. My two friends decided to go outside and have a cigarette, and since I didn't smoke, I just tagged along for fun. I was behind them, and as they opened the door, they said, Hey, the fire is still lit. I thought to myself, how could it possibly be lit? It was pouring buckets, and the fire was pretty much out by itself when we had left earlier. I looked over their shoulders, and I saw that fire still burning away, as if it was just lit. It was at full strength. Just after that, they kind of froze and whispered, What's that? Before yelling and running back into the room and slamming the front door shut. I couldn't get a visual on what they were talking about, because I was all the way behind them and it just happened so fast. So I just assumed they were joking but the expression on their faces showed pure fear. So I took it seriously and we all went into our bedroom and locked the door behind us. They were clearly frightened and completely out of breath. I asked them what they had seen and they said that they saw a wispy white figure that went behind a pine tree, which was about 15 feet from the fire pit. The figure apparently moved very quickly and then popped its head out to the side of the tree before hiding again. They described it as looking almost like smoke, but moving like a person. I peeked out the window to see if it was still there, and I didn't see anything, except for that fire, still burning. We basically stayed up all night. I had never seen my friends that afraid, especially one of them because he was in the military and was never afraid of anything. He just held his knife next to his chest while laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, not saying a word the whole night. In the morning, we tried finding an explanation for it, and we couldn't come up with anything. We spoke to the owner about it, and he told us he would be on the lookout. I wish I could have seen it for myself, but they swear by what they saw, and it wasn't anything they had ever seen before. We still can't find an explanation for what happened that night. I 
I stayed in an Airbnb cabin in the Gold Coast Mountains with some friends. The cabin was about 100 to 200 years old. Many terrifying, unexplainable things happened over the course of the weekend. When we first arrived, the vibe was pretty off, and everybody felt very unsettled, moody, and drained. There were many strange objects in the house, such as scissors on the walls, rusty nails and farm tools used as decor, unsettling masks on the walls, a heart with nails through it on the wall, rosary beads, and just things like that. The first thing that happened was that the first night, two of us were downstairs, unable to sleep, due to feeling very frightened and feeling watched. There was a lobby of sorts, separating the front door to the living area and the rest of the house. The door leading to the lobby area was suddenly smashed into so hard and loud that it rocked on its hinges. The next night, we were sitting on the deck and balcony over the forest, trying to recreate the sound of the bang on the door to our friends who had been asleep when it happened. After hitting the wall three times to try to recreate it, Three loud thuds were heard around the corner of the balcony, and a spare chair was dragged. We all decided to move a mattress into the one room so we could just sleep together, as we all felt unsafe. When three of us were up there, the window slammed shut on its own. Later that night, when everybody was asleep, at about three o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. I saw that the window that had slammed shut had a shadow moving across it. Ultimately, I figured out that it was a face. I finally fell asleep, but then I woke up to a man standing at the end of the bed at 6 a.m. He was dressed in indigenous clothing, a red, black, and white skirt type thing, and a red, black, and white sash, holding a spear and scowling at us. I absolutely panicked because for some reason in my sleepy state, I thought that it was the Airbnb owners and I woke up my friend who was in the bed next to me. She didn't see him. And eventually when I looked back at him, he was gone. I ended up feeling extremely nauseated and I asked my friend to leave early with me. As soon as I got about a kilometer away, I felt totally fine. I still can't explain what was going on in that cabin. About a month ago, I went with eight of my friends to a cabin. It belongs to one of the friends that came along. This place is right on the shore of a big river. We spent only two nights there. On the last night, we were all singing on the dock. It's more like a platform because it's surrounded by a fence and it's not used for boats, only for sitting around like we were. We were just having a usual night talk and it was about 4 a.m. All of a sudden, I heard this weird sound and I told them all to stay quiet and listen. We all shut up and we heard this melody that seemed like the song you might hear from a music box. The song lasted for less than 10 seconds and then vanished into silence. We all kind of got freaked out questioning what in the world we had just heard. We were completely alone at the cabin and there's no other house nearby. We spent the rest of the night sitting together on the dock, talking about paranormal stuff and coming up with theories. What's weird about the song is that it seemed to be coming from everywhere all at once, and it seemed to be very near. The next day when we woke up, the friend that has the cabin told us a little bit about the history of the house and about his grandparents who had built it. Apparently, his grandpa had given his wife, so my friend's grandma, a music box when they were young. He wasn't sure if this was actually true, but it was a family story that had been passed down. The whole place was quite creepy. There were a lot of weird dolls in every room, but I had just brushed it off in the beginning because the cabin was old. 
If we hadn't have had to leave that day, since our train wasn't that early, we would have investigated more by going to the villages. They were all about an hour and a half away by foot. We really wanted to ask the locals more about similar stories, but we didn't get the chance. However, I asked my friend later to tell me more about the history of the cabin, and this is what I found out. In the region the cabin is placed about 50 years ago, some tunnels were built and some of the workers died in the process of building them. My friend's grandparents, who were of course young at the time, decided to pay tribute to those who died by putting a cross on one of the mountains that are there with the help of a few other people. The cross was right in front of the deck that we were sitting on, on the other side of the river. My friend unfortunately can't really ask his grandparents more at the moment because they don't live in the same town and he doesn't want to tell them this over the phone for some reason. But in any case, it was a very interesting experience and we've never really come up with a sufficient explanation for what it was that we heard. Yesterday, my mom and I were going through an old photo album, and we found some pictures of when I was a child at a log cabin that we stayed at for a vacation once. While we were looking at the pictures, I said to my mom, this was the house where I had a ghost friend. I was about five or six years old when we stayed at the cabin. My mom and I slept in a spare room together with two twin beds because my mom hated hearing my dad snore. I vividly remember waking up in the middle of the night and there was a full shadow of a person next to the door of the room, close to where my mom was sleeping. I didn't feel scared. In fact, I just got up to get myself a snack. But as I did this, the shadow followed me. I could see him on the walls in the dark. Being only five years old, I really had no comprehension of what was happening, so I just went back to bed. The next night, when we were getting ready for bed, my mom made us sleep with my dad and for every night after that. Flash forward to us looking at these pictures, my mom told us that she felt so uncomfortable, like she was being watched in the cabin. I remember when I was a kid, I tried to tell them about my ghost friend, but they thought that he was something I made up but I told my mom exactly what I saw now that I was 18 and I could actually formulate the sentences, and she got goosebumps. I truly don't know how to explain what I saw back then, but I've always been a believer in ghosts ever since. This happened back in August of 2017, right before my second deployment. My best friend from high school, Kyle, and his girlfriend, Taylor, came out to New Mexico to visit my family and I. We decided a camping trip would be nice, but my kids were too young to do the whole tent thing. At the time, my oldest was three and my youngest was 18 months. We elected to rent a cabin at a campground in Weed, New Mexico, called Camp of the Tall Pines. We chose the biggest cabin that they had. If you want to rent it yourself, it's called Pooh's Corner. It's a two-bedroom cabin with a bathroom and living room with a good-sized fireplace. The fireplace has a cast iron door with a locking handle. The day we got there, we noticed that there was an old CRT TV with a satellite box hooked up to it. There was no DC cable for the box, so Kyle and I decided to run to the nearby town of Cloudcroft to see if we could find one. We figured it would give the kids something to do before they fell asleep and all that. We got back to the cabin a couple of hours later, and my wife asked me why I had come back to the cabin for roughly 30 minutes after I had left. She said that she heard me come in, 
rummage like I was looking for something, singing to myself, which I often do, and then I left again. But the problem is, I had never come back. In fact, at the time that she heard this, I would have been pulling into Cloudcroft. Things got a little crazy that night after we all went to bed. I had been working on building a fire in the fireplace that night, and had been decidedly unsuccessful. There was a little fire going, but nothing that would keep you warm. I gave up, and we all went to bed. I had a fan on me. I'm one of those guys that just can't sleep without a fan. My wife was in bed with me, and we heard this bumping sound coming from Kyle and Taylor's room. I figured Kyle was having problems getting comfortable. He's like 6'4", and the beds were not built with tall people in mind. Jess, my wife, got tired of the noise, and my fan blowing on her, and decided to sleep on the couch in the living room. A couple of hours later, I wake up to Jess screaming for me. I walk into the living room, and I see this roaring fire behind the cast iron door. She tells me that she woke up because she heard the handle rattling. Then the door opened of its own accord, and a massive fireball billowed out of the fireplace. Then the door latched itself just as I was walking in. I figured whatever ghost was there was just trying to give me a hand, so I went back to bed. The next morning, Kyle ribs me and asks if I had a good night. I asked him what he meant. He told me that he heard bumping against the wall all night and assumed that my wife and I were having fun. We decided it might be best if we didn't stay another night after that, and we left after that evening. To this day, we have no idea what that pounding was. It was 1994 in Hillsburg, California. It was just after sundown. My dad was driving me in the front passenger side of the bench seat of his old 1964 Oldsmobile along a dark back road in a small town. All of a sudden, straight in front of us, the headlights lit up a little boy. He was roughly six or seven years of age with blonde hair and blue eyes wearing a striped shirt, a blue windbreaker, blue jeans, tennis shoes, and a baseball cap, just standing in front of us, staring right through the windshield at us, or beyond us. My dad slammed on the brakes so hard that our heads kind of dipped forward and down. The car lurched. When we came to a stop, we looked back up, and in place of the boy, was a deer. It looked at us and then ran off into the woods. My dad turned to look at me and said, wasn't that a little boy? Yes, I replied. He said, okay, and turned to look at the road and just drove on. And to this day, I can't explain it. I've only told this to a handful of people in my life, but it's really been bothering me lately for some reason, so I thought I'd get it off my chest and maybe somebody will get some enjoyment out of it. I've looked up similar events to what occurred to me and I saw a post from about a year ago on Reddit describing something similar, so I thought I'd share. Take it for what you will. A little backstory. I'm from Northern California in the Sacramento area. All my life, I wanted to be a cop. After the army, I got hired as a sheriff's deputy in the Sacramento area in late 2011. I worked patrol and was also on the CSI team as collateral assignment. So I would work normal 12-hour patrol shifts, answering calls and doing standard cop stuff. And then I would go to CSI calls for serious stuff. By early 2017, I was badly burned out and I found a new purpose in life and quit. 
This story occurred at the end of 2016. I'm not religious at all, but I am spiritual. The house that I grew up in as a kid was haunted by something serious, and I've experienced my fair share of quite serious paranormal events as a kid. But nothing since about the age of 15. Until this happened, and I was about 33 when it occurred. In late 2016, I was working day shift patrol in a smaller town in our county. I get sent to a Safeway grocery store to a report of domestic violence which was occurring in the store. Being a deputy, I'm alone and I have no partner, but I have backup that's coming, but it's like 20 minutes away. It's reported that a younger Hispanic male is slapping around a younger Hispanic female. It's now over and they're checking out and they're not fighting anymore. I show up and enter the store and immediately recognize these people. They were gang members. You see them now and again in the area, but it's semi-rural and these people mostly lurk in Sacramento and don't really come to the area much. We were about 30 minutes from Sacramento. I won't go into the whole thing, but I could just tell. The guy also had some teardrop tattoo on his face and some tattoo on his neck that gave it away. I knew what I was dealing with. They're compliant and they say nothing happened and agree to come outside to talk. I pat them down, separate them, handcuff them, sit them down a good distance apart from each other, and I start interviewing one half of the party to figure out what occurred and if anybody needed to go to jail. They're both sitting on the curb out front of the store, with their legs kicked out facing the parking lot. My back is to the parking lot and I'm facing the store. It's about one o'clock in the middle of a weekday in a strip mall. There are dozens of people shopping and going about their business. As I'm talking to one of them, getting their half of the story and taking notes, clear as day, I hear the most beautiful female voice I've ever heard in my life. It sounded smooth and almost like really good computer AI, like that customer service phone support AI that you can't tell if it's human or not but it's just a little too perfect to be human? That voice spoke inside my head. This was not my gut feeling or my inner monologue or my sixth sense or training or whatever you want to call it. It was an outside voice that was not mine or from my thoughts, and it was like beamed inside my head. All it said was, turn around. At the same time it took to say turn around, maybe a second, I simultaneously saw my entire life flash before my eyes. Then I saw a Hispanic man in his 30s, wearing blue jeans, Adidas shoes, and a red plaid long sleeve lumberjack type shirt, walk up behind me and shoot me in the back of the head in the parking lot. It's like a 33 year long movie of my entire life just played out in like a half a second inside my head. So when a disembodied voice tells you to do something, you do it, right? I turned around and this exact person that I had seen in my vision of me dying, wearing the exact same clothes, with the exact same cars behind him in the backdrop, is walking up behind me and is about 15 feet away from me. The exact guy from my vision is now standing behind me. I confront him without pulling out my gun and I can immediately tell that this guy is legit and is up to no good that he's purposefully trying to sneak up behind me. I'm professional but firm, trying to address the situation and process what just occurred at the same time. I don't have time to deal with this guy and the two detained persons. The short of it is that the two detained people are his friends and he wanted to come see what was happening because he was concerned for their well-being. Yeah, no. He basically gets told to F off or he's going to jail and he agrees that's a good idea. He walks back into the parking lot and disappears from view amongst the cars. He walks away easily a hundred meters and appears to be gone. I go back to interviewing one half of this domestic and about a minute later, the same thing occurs as the first time. The voice, the vision, the guy, the exact same thing. I turn around again, but I pull my gun out. I regret to this day not pointing it at him and proning him out on the ground, because I would love to know if he actually had a gun, but I suspect he did based on how he was walking, and how he kept moving behind me. 
I asked for my cover officer to expedite with lights and sirens, and the second this guy hears the sirens, he quickly walks into the store and disappears. Don't ask me why I didn't do what I knew was right, and what I was trained to do. I just didn't. All I could think of is that I wanted this guy away from my presence. I don't want to search him, or get near him, or talk to him, or deal with anything about him. All I want at this moment is for him to not exist and be gone. He had a horrible energy to him, like an almost evil energy. I've only felt that type of energy coming from another person a few times in my life. People that have experienced this might know what I mean. And that's it. My partner shows up, we deal with the couple, the male half goes to jail for beating on his girl, and she goes about her business. I go into the store with my partner to look for the gun guy, and we never find him. He must have gone out the other entrance. I didn't mention it to anybody for years, definitely not to any other cops, as they probably would have taken me off the streets. I can't prove that it occurred other than my word. One of the single craziest things that has ever happened to me. I've heard other weird stories as a cop from other cops regarding hauntings and stuff like that, but this was definitely the weirdest. Take the story as you will, and hopefully you enjoyed it, but it is true. I used to work in a haunted shoe store in California. It was tiny, and our staff was usually only four to five at any given time. We would very often be by ourselves, especially at opening or closing. Most of us had some kind of brush with our ghost, usually hearing noises or feeling watched, but sometimes things would fly off the shelves. I had an experience with something touching my hair when I was alone, and at one point the lights in the store went out in such a way that the only lights that stayed lit formed a kind of ring right above where I was standing. These lights were not activated by the same switch, so although I'm sure there's a mundane reason why just those lights would have stayed on, they weren't connected. About a couple of months before I quit, I started hearing boxes in the back being pulled out and shoved back into the wall, and whenever I would go to investigate, nothing would be there. Once I walked in the back, it would stop. As soon as I left, it would start. It happened pretty consistently, but I wrote it off as maybe the ghost, but also maybe something else. I didn't really bother to mention it to anyone else at work. Eventually, my coworker, who was not at all into the supernatural and didn't actually know about any of our experiences, told me that he had heard what sounded like someone messing with the shoe boxes while he was alone at night but it would stop whenever he would go to check. This went on for a few of his closing shifts, and eventually he decided to try and follow the noise, pulling out boxes and kind of banging on them in case it was a rat or something. We never actually had any evidence of rodents in the store, and it was definitely a new experience. I had never had it happen in the over three years of working there. Currently, my husband and I live with my in-laws in a very old house, also in California. All of us have experienced things here as well, and my sister-in-law's fiancé has seen older people in the front yard. My mother-in-law's bedroom has what feels like a male presence, and no matter how much feminine decor and pink she uses, it always just feels like a man's room. She's also had something stroke her legs at night, there has been a presence in our bedroom, too, but after a cleansing, our room is the only place that feels quiet in the house. One more California story. My husband and I went to check out this New Age shop that I had recommended to me. I hit it off with the reader there, and she told me about the shop she used to work at. And even though she didn't give any details, she implied that she left because it wasn't her type of place. The name was distinctive, and it was a city away. We went to run some other errands in the area, and accidentally took a couple of wrong turns, ending up in the exact same city as that other New Age shop she mentioned. I looked it up, and it was less than a mile away, so we decided to check it out. The shop itself was really cool, but I got a very strange vibe. 
so I didn't want to stick around very long. My husband wound up sitting next to this huge altar until I was ready to leave, and later that night, he said he felt really weird, like there was something he needed to get off of him but couldn't. I had felt it too, but since it was late, I decided not to burn sage. I drew a cleansing sigil on his back. The second I was done, we both heard a loud hissing or cough sound from the corner of our bedroom, and the feeling went away. As far as I can tell, the entire Monterey Peninsula in California is super active, paranormally. Monterey was the first capital of California until they changed it to Sacramento. Colton Hall by downtown Monterey was the courthouse, the city hall, and the jail. They used to hang people in the front of the building. Also, Carmel Mission is extremely active as well. I've been in a couple of weddings that were held there, and I also went there for field trips in school, and just to see it. My friends, myself, and my son have all had our own experiences there. My son is not a believer. I am a sensitive and a psychic medium. Growing up there, I thought activity like that was just normal, but it most definitely is not. The places I mentioned are just the known places, but there are so many more. This area is extremely paranormally active for anybody who wants to check it out. Prior to 2016, I lived in Palmdale, California. My sister, who we'll call Honey, and my youngest daughter lived with my mother in a rented townhouse apartment in Oxnard, about two hours away. Each week or two, I made the long drive to take them shopping and clean their house because they were both disabled. My mother was my heart, and my sweet sister helped raise me, so anything they needed, I was there for them. On the first floor, the kitchen was in the back with a door that opened to the backyard, then a big open space and then the living room and the front door. On the right, the bathroom and my mother's bedroom. On the left, the stairs with a half wall railing going up to the first landing. My mom was sitting in her lift recliner, on the right, facing the base of the stairs. One night, we were all sitting in the living room, watching a show with the lights on. My daughter was upstairs in her room. We were laughing at something that we saw on TV when I saw something on the stairs. It darted down the steps really quickly, peeking up at me, then ducked down behind the railing, followed by a cold chill that entered the living room. At the same time, my mother commented that it was cold and pulled her robe together. At first I thought it was my daughter playing tricks on me, but when she didn't pop up, I felt concerned. I said, Mama, did you see something? because she had full sight if there was anything there. She said, no dear, I thought I did, but there's nothing there. That's when it hit me, and instinctively I knew what it was and where it had come from. I ran up the stairs and burst into my daughter's room. What did you do? I said. She looked at me with her eyes wide. She knew exactly what I was referring to and started apologizing. I told her to tell me what she had done to bring it into the house. She proceeded to tell me that when her girlfriends were there, they thought it would be fun to try to summon a spirit. Then they tried to reach out to the father of one of her friends, who had passed away two years prior. But she said that something else came through. And it scared them, so they stopped, and her friends ran home without even saying goodbye. I was furious. How dare you play with something you don't understand? I told her. I told her that I knew she was just trying to help a friend, but that I had warned her for years to never go messing around with things she didn't understand and had no control over. 
I was thinking that not only do I constantly have to worry about my family's health now, but I'll have to worry about this as well. I knew they'd been playing with a Ouija board, so I asked if she had at least closed the session. She just looked at me with a blank stare. Obviously, she did not. She said they'd made the board out of paper, and when they were done, they just ripped it up and threw it away. That door had to be closed, I said. We gathered the pieces and she called her friends. Two of them were too scared to come back, so we had to perform the closing without them. But in the back of my head, I knew that it didn't work and that whatever had decided to come through that portal was still there, hiding. At that point, there was nothing I could have done, viewing the circumstances at the time. Fast forward to 2016. I had an opportunity waiting for me in Washington State, so I begged and pleaded for my mother and sister to go with me. But my sister Honey was fanatically scared of change, and although my mother desperately wanted to go with me, she couldn't leave my sister's side. I wish now that I had been more persistent. So I moved, reluctantly leaving them with my daughter and her now husband to take over their care. Within those two years, my eldest sister Honey's health severely declined, and my mother shared with me eight months after I moved that she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. I flew and drove back and forth to be with them, and every time I showed them pretty pictures of my new life our beautiful green surroundings, and I begged them to return with me. And every time, Honey would say that she was too apprehensive to leave, and said no. In 2018, they both passed away. My mother from cancer, and my sister from an existing illness, taking a big part of my heart and soul with them. My daughter and her husband moved out, leaving all of my mother and sister's things there. Somebody had to put their stuff in storage. And of course, it had to be me. Even though I was the youngest of six, I felt it was my duty. I drove there with my two grandchildren, eight and four, because at the time, there was no one available to watch them for that long of a period of time. When we arrived, the place was in shambles. Dirty dishes, moldy food lined the counters, and the sink was piled up. It looked like there was soot all over the floor. Mom and Honey's personal belongings were strewn around the house, and in my mother's room, a barricade of trash piled all the way up to her door. In the middle of the floor, in an open space, was a full-length mirror I had never seen before, hanging off of a wooden ladder. I just stood there and cried. I set up a clean spot in the living room for my grandson to play on his tablet, and my granddaughter wanted to help. As I was bagging things up in the kitchen, I noticed her standing there and staring into the mirror. I didn't really think anything of it, but she just kept standing there. Then I heard her say, while not looking away from the mirror, Nana, can you get rid of this mirror? I thought she wanted me to just move it, but she was adamant that it be removed from the house. I asked her why, why did she look so scared? She told me that while she was looking into the mirror, she was standing alone. She couldn't see anything in the reflection around or behind her. Just darkness all around, and something was coming. I looked at the mirror myself, and it did look very dark. Say no more, not only did I take it outside, I smashed it into little pieces and threw it in the trash can. We decided to sleep in the living room and it took days to even come close to being done. This was the last night, and we were alone. I just mopped downstairs, so I locked the doors and all the windows in the whole house, and we slept upstairs in the bedroom, across from my daughter's old room. We hunkered down on some mattresses on the floor. I always left a light on in the hall. I'm reading a book online. My granddaughter had fallen asleep next to me, and my grandson was on his tablet at the end of the bed. I was getting sleepy, and my grandson started to yawn. He looked up from his tablet, and his eyes got super big. Then he ran to the door shouting, Spooky! Spooky! and slammed it, running back. He quickly got under the covers and got as close to me as he could. All this made me feel very uneasy. 
I could see movement in the hall, dimming the light around and under the door, making swirling strange shapes, as if somebody were pacing, followed by surges of blackness and wisps of cool air coming from the space under the door. That night was long, and I felt on guard, until I finally fell asleep as well. But I woke up hours later and I had to go to the bathroom. But honestly, I was too scared. I was waiting for daybreak, but I just couldn't wait any longer. I slowly opened the door, fearing what was waiting me on the other side. There was nothing, but also I knew that there was. I could feel it. I tried to be as fast as I could, and I left the bathroom door open so that I could hear the kids. Then I ran back, hearing a swoosh behind me. I slammed the door and laid holding the kids until daybreak. I received a call from my sister later that morning. She couldn't understand how we'd been able to stay in that house. When I asked her why, she told me that when she was there grabbing some boxes of pictures, she heard noises coming from my daughter's room upstairs. She said it was loud and she felt an evil presence and everything inside told her to leave, so she did. She also told me something that I didn't know at the time, that my son-in-law was practicing black magic and intentionally summoning dark energy in that room. Not cool. Late that afternoon, everything was done. The kids were in the car and the car was packed. I just wanted to look at my mother's bedroom one last time, where she used to sleep. These walls had so many memories. I felt like if I looked hard enough, I would see her laying where the bed had been. And in my mind, I was telling myself not to cry. As I stood in the doorway, a chill went up my spine. The hairs on the back of my neck and arms started to raise, and I could feel something closing in on me. In my ear, I felt a warm breath, and I heard one loud word. Run. I ran out of the house so fast, not even locking the door. As we were driving off, my granddaughter asks me, Nana, who's that person standing in the window upstairs? My family and I have moved from Alaska to California, Fort Irwin to be specific. We just got the house today, and obviously the house isn't furnished. It's just empty space everywhere. As we were with the agents talking to them about the house, my son wandered off into the soon-to-be living room and came back crying. I figured he wanted his toys or just a drink. My son is two. He's pretty vocal about what he wants most of the time, but he just looked frightened. As we wrapped things up with the realtor, my son kept crying as soon as we all met back up in the living room. I was concerned about the way my son was acting, so I just picked him up. As I'm walking around the house one more time, I noticed that when we went back into the living room portion of the house, he covered his eyes with his hands. Fast forward to later in the day, I take my family out to eat and grab a few essentials, thinking he may have gotten over whatever was bothering him. The moment we pulled into the driveway, he closed his eyes and covered them with his hands. As I took him inside, my wife let the dogs out, and the dogs haven't been acting any differently. But the moment we stepped into that living room, my son is crying, running to us for a hug and to pick him up. We are all currently upstairs right now, and he seems like his normal self. The dogs haven't been acting out of character either. He's just genuinely afraid of being downstairs. I'm pretty concerned, but I don't have the feeling that a ghost is in my house. Maybe I'm just oblivious, but I'm not really sure what I should do. I've been backpacking and camping, mostly solo, as an adult, for the majority of my life. I'm cautious about my surroundings, and I listen carefully when I'm out. I try to remain an observer, 
and move through the land with little impact. I'm also very interested in the mysterious and obscure, cryptids, alternate realities, and the unexplained. I've read most of the missing 411 cases, and am a serious devotee of true crime. All of the morbid and curious things I can find. Anything strange that will fire the imagination. There have been occasions where I have felt slightly uncomfortable, or watched even, when I have been out in the woods, but mostly I've chalked it up to being alone and alert. Maybe my inherent skepticism makes me less susceptible to encounters which others experience. I look for logical conclusions first. I've never encountered any truly off or deranged people out in the forests, but I do consider that the biggest threat is the human animal. A few years ago, I set out to camp near an old growth forest in North Georgia. Most old growth here is gone, but there are places that haven't been logged. And if you get the chance to visit one, wherever you may live, I would suggest it. It's beautiful, serene, and alive in a way that's hard to describe. This particular forest was one of hemlock and poplar, and the trees were massive. I had a guidebook that gave directions out into the sticks, following little country roads that eventually turned into gravel. After a long drive into a national forest, I parked near the trail which was unmaintained, meaning it wasn't very popular or highly traveled. I hiked out through the woods to where the trail eventually just kind of stopped. There was very little undergrowth. I spent the afternoon just exploring, looking at the trees and enjoying the calm. I eventually made my way down to a creek and crossed over it to an old field that formed a sort of bowl in the land with hills and ridges on all sides. The fact that there was a field meant that there had, I guessed at one point, been people living in the area, but I saw nothing of the sort when I was there, and my map showed that I should have been far from any roads or settlements. I set up tent and made some food. It was late when I decided to have a little smoke and lay out in the field in front of my tent and look at the stars before bed. There was little to no light pollution and I always relished the opportunity to enjoy the sky at times like those. As I was laying there, I began hearing a loud knocking sound from up near the ridge where I'd been earlier in the day, maybe a thousand yards away. Three knocks and a long pause, followed by three more, and then it would repeat. When I say knocks, what I mean is a very loud noise, like two logs or trees being hit together loud enough to reverberate in the little bowl that I was in, loud enough that you could almost feel it. I could pinpoint where the sound was coming from, but it was night in the forest, and anyone who's been out there knows that it is dark. I thought it had to be a person making the noise, because what else would make such a rhythmic sound? It was extremely loud, and it would have taken considerable effort to produce. I'd seen nobody else at all during the day, and the direction from which the sound came was in the section of old growth that I had explored earlier. And that's it. Eventually the sound stopped, and I went to bed feeling like I had heard something I wasn't meant to hear. Or maybe that I'd heard something specifically meant for me and me alone to hear. I packed up and hiked out the next day. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't hyper aware and waiting for something else to happen, but Nothing did. I've told friends about this, and they'll either say it was for sure a Sasquatch, or that I was for sure close to someone's house that I just didn't know about. But why would a person be out in the woods, late at night, banging logs together in the dark? My boyfriend Jason, a 27-year-old male, and I, a 23-year-old female, went on a month-long camping trip to multiple states. Everything had been going really well, until October 9th. We decided to ditch a campground reservation and randomly pitch our tent near Albion Basin, within the Uinta Mountains, Alta, Utah, not far off the Secret Lake trailhead. 
We parked our car around 3 p.m. at the Albion Basin campground, closed for the season. Admittedly, it was a little tense because this was our first dispersed camping attempt and we had no proper backpacking gear. Upon arrival, we realized the area we wanted to pitch our tent was about two miles uphill. At this point, we started to express regret as we had a planned campsite in Nafi, Utah that we decided to skip on a whim. After grumping around a bit and having a large lunch to avoid packing food, we packed our backpacks with the best gear we had to get through the night, as it was going to be about 25 degrees Fahrenheit. We set out up the trail, seeing the occasional family or couple heading down the mountain. As we trudged on, we both started to feel strange, as if we did not really even know why we were doing this, as if we should have just gotten a hotel instead of trying to play backpackers for the night. But we both felt like we had something to prove, so we continued. Fast forward, we made it up to Secret Lake. Totally empty, so nothing like the pictures. Disappointing and eerie. Whatever, we keep hiking up and up in an attempt for seclusion and flat land, when we stumble across a decent space. I see a small cave in the distance and point it out to Jason to deliberate if it's a hell no kind of situation. But after he checked it out, he said it seemed like a small animal crawl space. No biggie. We set up as nightfall was quickly approaching, played some cards, bundled up, and decided to go to bed early at about 8.30 p.m. We planned to leave as soon as possible in the morning, maybe 5 a.m. We both dwindled slowly, and after what felt like about 30 minutes, I woke up abruptly at 11.24 p.m. I woke up with a feeling that I have never experienced before. I woke up wide awake, scared but unprovoked, and as if there was no way in hell I was going to fall back asleep, when I always sleep through the night. Jason was asleep, so I let him be and just lie there. Alert. Trying to listen to anything I could hear, which was nothing. Around 12 a.m., Jason woke up stirring, much to my delight as I didn't want to feel alone anymore. I told him I couldn't sleep, but he suggested I just rest my eyes as we were leaving early in the morning. I agreed, initially not wanting to be a baby, and say that I was actually very scared. This was very short-lived, as Jason couldn't fall back asleep himself, and we ended up just laying there together trying to sleep, when I ended up blurting out that I was scared. We agreed that it was fine for us to just stick it out through the night, because it was now approaching 2.30 in the morning. We had a small axe and a pellet gun for protection, so I didn't need to be frightened. Not even five minutes later, we're still wide awake and Jason's head perks up so fast, my heart jumped out of my chest. I whispered, what is it? He replied, listen. I kid you not, we distinctly heard the sound of gravel crunching under boots, as if somebody was walking up to our tent, stopping, and then walking to my side of the tent. I felt the blood drain out of my face in an instant. In real time, this all occurred in no more than 10 seconds, but my mind flashed a million thoughts, and for a millisecond, I was convinced it was a ranger coming to tell us we couldn't camp there. So I called out, hello? My brain was entirely sure that I heard human footsteps. Within two to three seconds of hearing the footsteps, Jason grabbed the gun and busted out of the tent for any chance to confront this person, as I knew that he had heard exactly what I had heard. Nothing. There was nothing there. As soon as Jason busted out of the tent and me after him, there was nothing there. We had heard something walk up so clearly, but nothing walk away. Hardly exchanging two words, we packed up our stuff looking over our shoulders terrified, feeling watched, and booked it down the mountain with only moonlight guiding our way, too scared to turn on our flashlights. This was the worst 20 to 30 minutes of my life, half expecting to look over my shoulder and find somebody or something following us. When we made it to our car, we locked the doors and started the descent out of the mountains, almost speechless and scared out of our minds. At this point, we reached town at about 3.30 in the morning and slept in a well-lit parking lot of a grocery store. We have obviously since discussed what happened that night and we're both unsure. 
but were still haunted by the sound of those footsteps. One time, my best friend and I were camping by the lake and decided that we wanted to go on a night hike. It was about 30 minutes to sunset and the trail was about eight miles. While we were walking, we saw these weird lights in the forest that looked like tail lights, but we knew that there was no tail. The woods were way too thick to drive a car through. So we decided to go a little bit off the trail to find them. They just kept going deeper and deeper into the woods. So we decided to head back. But when we turned around, we didn't recognize where we were and it was getting dark. So we knew the lake was about southwest and so we used the sun on the horizon to find our way back to the trail. By the time we got there, we had been walking about 20 minutes, but we were six miles in on the trail. It still blows my mind how we walked off the trail and somehow cleared six miles in that much time. But to make it worse, the entire time we were walking through the woods after, something was following us. We never saw what it was, and to make it a little less spooky, we joked about silly things like maybe it was a puppy or a garden gnome. But in reality, we were both freaking out internally. It took us two hours to hike back to our camp, but somehow only 20 minutes to get there in the first place. To this day, I can't explain what happened. We were going camping in Western Washington. It was late and we weren't going to make it to our usual campsite. So my uncle mentioned that he knew about a lake not far off the freeway. My uncle had a box truck and we were all going to sleep in it. There were six kids and my uncle and father. My dad was driving an old Bronco with some of us with him. When we found the lake and parked, us kids went to bed in the box truck because it was close to midnight. My dad and uncle started a campfire and were just BSing. I couldn't sleep, so I was chilling in my sleeping bag listening to them. All of a sudden, we started hearing wild noises, like chanting, and then these sounds that just made the hair on my neck stand straight up. I immediately thought Bigfoot. My dad and uncle freaked out, and my dad got his pistol out. They waited another 10 minutes, and the sounds got louder. Then they got everybody up and packed us all up, and we left in a hurry. I have never seen them that scared. We were all scared. I have no idea what the location was now. I was nine years old and this was back in the 80s, but that experience never left me. This is a real experience that happened to me when I was around 10 camping with my family at a provincial park in Newfoundland, Canada in the mid-1980s. In Newfoundland, there's a lot of traditional folklore about fairies and being fairy-led. It's sort of like being mesmerized and stolen away by the fairies. And although I've never really believed in that stuff, whenever I hear those tales, I can't help but think about this experience. We arrived at the campground in mid-afternoon. I remember that it was strangely empty. We saw no other occupied sites as we drove around, looking for the perfect spot. We picked our site, and as my parents were setting up, my older sister asked if she and I could go check out the little beach area, which was a shortish walk along a clearly marked downhill path through some birch woods. Our mom said yes, but told us to be back in two hours. We found the sign pointing us to the beach trail and headed down the path. Almost as soon as we were out of sight of the campground, things started to feel off. It was weirdly quiet, with a sort of muffled feeling. No birds calling, no breeze, just a thick, velvety silence. 
I also noticed that there were strange looking ferns growing thickly along the path all around us. Ferns are not an unusual sight in the Newfoundland woods, but these were different from the ones I'd seen before. Bright, almost luminous green, and very, very large. Some were as tall as I was. I couldn't shake the feeling that there were people or animals hiding in them, watching us pass by. Although it had been a lovely, clear day, the weather started to change as we walked. A low-lying fog rolled in as we descended, first in tendrils close to the ground, then gradually rising around us as we went lower toward the water. Even living in Newfoundland, I had never walked into a fog like that before, and it did nothing to relieve the eerie feeling that I was trying to ignore. Finally, we arrived at a steep set of wooden stairs, and following them, we emerged onto a small, foggy beach. With the woods behind and above us, it felt very closed in, and I started wishing that we were safely back with our parents at our campsite. My sister made a small noise beside me, and I turned to see what had caught her attention. Although I thought we were alone, I now noticed that there was a man several meters away, standing very still and gazing silently out over the water. My sister called out a friendly hello. It was Newfoundland in the 80s, people did that sort of thing. But he didn't move or appear to hear her. After a minute or two, I started to feel nervous, so I talked my sister into heading back to our campsite. This is where things get a bit fuzzy. I don't remember leaving the beach, but the next thing I knew, we were on a wide, unfamiliar dirt road. It seemed like no time had passed, but I was tired and my legs and feet felt like I'd been walking for a long time. The sun was also pretty low in the sky, which was strange because I thought we'd been gone for less than an hour. I felt disoriented and I had no idea where we were and I started to panic a bit, thinking that we were lost. My sister immediately went into protective older sibling mode, saying not to worry because she was pretty sure that she knew the way back. We headed off down the road in the direction she suggested and walked for about 45 minutes or so until we finally emerged at the campground, not far from our campsite. It was now almost completely dark and we ran to our trailer to find our dad there, worriedly asking where we had been. Although we thought we'd been gone for under two hours, my dad said we'd been gone for more than five. He said that our mom had headed to the beach to look for us while he had stayed to wait for us at the campsite. By now, full-on darkness was setting in, and our dad was worried that our mom hadn't returned with us. As he prepared to go out looking for her, she burst through the door, frantically saying that she'd run up and down the trail multiple times and still hadn't found us. She was amazed when she saw us. The only way to access that beach, aside from cutting through steep, thick woods, was to take that trail, and we had not passed her. Once we'd all calmed down, we ate dinner and headed to bed. As I lay in my bunk, I remember hearing my mom quietly tell my dad how creepy and strange the trail had felt. Although we'd planned to stay longer, we packed up and left quickly the following morning, and we never returned to that campground. I always wanted to try the car life thing after watching so many YouTubers who live in their vans and travel around the country. I lived in Fort Lauderdale for five years, and I thought that I would be stuck there and that was it. Then the pandemic hit, and when I checked my bank account, I was back paid thousands of dollars. Before I knew it, I was packing up all my stuff, and the landlord said I could leave all my furniture and that was fine. Now I'm on the 95 heading north, laughing, actually leaving. I couldn't believe it. I managed to get a hang of the whole car life thing, and I became more comfortable stealth parking in different places and not being detected. I hadn't done any off-grid stuff yet, but I was more comfortable by the time I reached Lake Tahoe. 
I was hiking, and I asked some guy with his dog if he knew where I could sleep in my car, because Tahoe seemed a little tricky. He said there was a place up in the mountains called Hope Valley. It sounded good, so off I went. Lake Tahoe is already very high in altitude, so this was a few thousand feet higher than that. It was this past July. As I reached the area, I saw a small parking lot that was an entrance to a wildlife nature preserve. It was closed and empty, so that would do. I'm all settled in with my blanket, and the sun is setting, and the temperature plummets. Before I know it, it's pitch black, and visibility is zero. I start to hear wolves howling, and at this point, I'm game. This was the experience I wanted. It was a little creepy, but I was fine. I was living what I would normally be watching on YouTube in my apartment. Before the sun went down, I noticed that there were garbage cans that were overfilled about 15 feet from the car at the entrance to the preserve. I finally drifted off to sleep, and I was awakened by something at 3 a.m. I couldn't see anything, anywhere. It was so dark. And then I heard heavy footsteps right outside my door. At this point, I am really freaked out. Then something brushes up against the car. I'm scared, and I'm not really sure what to do. I wait for a couple of minutes. Then I open the door, run around the car as fast as I could, and got in the driver's seat. I drove down the mountain and slept at a Motel 6 parking lot like a baby. I never made it through my first and only off-grid car camping adventure, and I won't forget it. The only other time that trip that something creepy happened was in Mount Shasta. I drove halfway up the mountain, parked on the side of the road, and got out and started walking to this trail. I made it about 70 yards, and I heard a low growl. I've never run so hard back to my car in my life. The rest of the trip was just the best hiking I've ever had in Montana. Still, I'll never forget the sound of those footsteps. First of all, I don't know if this will be scary to you, but it was for me when it happened, and I still get a little frightened when I remember. I can assure you that this story is 100% true. My story starts when I was 15 years old in 2012. Three of my very best friends and I decided to go camping. Luke, who was 17, Lewis, who was 16, and Gary, who was 15. Since our dads all worked in the military, we had access to some woods that weren't very far away from our homes, three miles at most. Of course, we weren't trained on anything, but since I lived some time in the middle of the Amazon forest, I had confidence that I could handle a not very far from my house night. It was July, which is winter here in Brazil, and it was really cold, like five degrees Celsius kind of cold, and things were pretty much going as well as you would expect from a camp in the woods. We pretty much sat there and chatted until about one in the morning. Then we decided to take shifts in duos to watch out for any animals that could be near us. We were afraid of jaguars, but probably the most that could get near us would be some capybaras that are pretty common in the region. At around 4 a.m., Gary, my duo, was outside the tent calling for me to stay up with him. But as it was so cold, I wanted to stay inside saying that no animal would go near us with the noise we were making. After like five minutes of back and forth between us, we noticed that we couldn't hear any kind of forest noise. No crickets, owls, twigs breaking from passing animals, nothing. And a feeling of uneasiness began to grow between us. Now I know this whole thing of no forest noise and yada yada sounds a little bit cliche, but I swear that this is real. When something weird is about to happen, everything goes quiet. With this feeling that appeared, we stopped arguing, and we started to pay attention for what was happening around us. We didn't want to wake up Luke and Lewis because we thought we were just being silly and nothing would happen. Then, from the middle of the woods, we hear a scream. It sounded like a woman screaming, 
but at the same time, it didn't. The scream sounded human, but something was off. It had a kind of animalistic tone to it. It's really hard to explain. I've searched all over the internet, and I can't find any creature that sounded like that. I firmly believe it was not a human screaming. Besides, what would a woman be doing in the woods, alone at night, screaming? With the sound, Luke and Lewis woke up, a little disoriented, while Gary and I jumped out of the tent and grabbed some sticks. That was the only thing we could find that would serve as a weapon. Needless to say, we didn't sleep the rest of the night, and we not so patiently awaited the morning. After what seemed to be hours, but was probably no more than five minutes, the forest resumed its regular noises, and we calmed down a little bit. When the sun rose, we packed our things as fast as we could, and left. When we were getting outside the forest, we told the military that was guarding the woods what we heard, but I'm not really sure if they believed some random teenagers. I'm still friends with those guys that camped with me, and every time I see them, I ask them if they remember this, and they all said that they do. And none of us can imagine what could have been screaming that night. We'll never know if we were in any real danger or not. I'm just glad that we got out of it alive. I'm going to preface this story by saying that paranormal experiences are not abnormal to me. I have seen ghosts many times over my life, and my mom claims to have seen me playing with them as a child. My mom was a psychic medium, so I spent a good deal of my childhood around this stuff. But those are experiences for another time. This is just a little context to assure you that I have had experiences with the paranormal before, and that what I experienced this time, I consider to be abnormal, generally, as most of my experiences up until now have been positive or at least neutral. This was a few years ago, in my very early 20s. I hadn't had any paranormal experiences since a little while after my mom died when I was a teenager. I was starting to think that the things I had experienced didn't happen at all. General denial. One night, on a whim while driving around a suburb near my house, I managed to convince my boyfriend to come with me to the local cemetery. I was going through a bit of an edgy phase and thought going to a cemetery at night would be cool. This is a cemetery in a big city, and it's extremely large. I didn't believe in ghosts hanging around in a cemetery, so I thought it would be fine. I believed the ghosts usually hung out around the places that they died, or places where they had unfinished business, and that it was very unlikely that they would be hanging around a graveyard. It was some time in October, but not Halloween. We got to the cemetery at about 11.30pm, and messed around in the car for a bit before getting out sometime around 12am. We had our phones with us and were using them as torches. We hopped the fence to the cemetery and started to look at all the graves, pointing out the most interesting ones and just kind of messing around. The place was completely deserted, as cemeteries tend to be at midnight. We walked farther and farther in and entered a part of the cemetery where the graves were quite a bit larger and much older. By now, it had likely been around a half an hour. As we were walking down the path, my boyfriend commented that there was a strange smell lingering around, which was extremely weird because my boyfriend can't smell at all. He lost his sense of smell due to a bunch of infections and other problems with his ears and sinuses as a child. I don't know all the details, but regardless, he can never smell anything. I couldn't smell anything, and I have an above-normal sense of smell, so we both shrugged off the experience. I was looking at one of the graves some time later, when my boyfriend shook my shoulder and pointed at one of the largest graves a few meters into the distance. I am terrible at knowing what people are pointing at, but this time, I spotted it right away. It was a little girl, I would guess around 11 or 12 years old. She had very dark brown or black hair, 
that looked well cared for and quite long. She was sitting on top of the grave with her legs dangling over the edge. At first I saw her wearing a lacy white dress, like a nightgown that a rich girl would wear. It looked old, but I'm no expert, so I couldn't tell you how old. Maybe early 1900s? But I looked away to look at my boyfriend, and when I looked back, she was wearing a different dress. All I remember is that it was red, because at this point I was super scared. Something about the whole situation just felt wrong to me. I felt extremely fearful. And due to the fact that ghosts were very normal for me, this was extremely unusual. I had never felt unsafe seeing a ghost before. It was around this time that I noticed that the cemetery was eerily quiet. No sounds of bats, and there are lots of fruit bats in the area. No other animals. The air itself felt stale and stagnant. We just stood and stared at the little girl for what felt like an eternity, strangely transfixed. And then, we both ran for it up the path at full speed. I turned for a second to see if she was still there, but she was gone completely. And that made me run faster, honestly. The whole run out, we were both dead silent. When we were back at the car, we sat there for ages trying to work out what we had just experienced and seen, trying to rationalize it. But as we've both had paranormal experiences before, we knew it had to be a ghost. For a few months afterward, I continuously felt like I was being watched. I had frequent nightmares about seeing the little girl in our apartment. I always felt uneasy. We eventually moved around 30 minutes away, and the feelings and dreams stopped. I have since tried to research the ghost, but haven't turned anything up. Though there is a local ghost tour at that cemetery. Maybe the guide might know something. Ever since then, my paranormal experiences have been more frequent, and have been getting more unsettling and disturbing. My boyfriend has been experiencing more things too. I'm not really sure what happened there, but nothing's quite been the same since. One day, I decided to go to an old cemetery in San Diego, California, in a town called Julian. This town was home to gold miners and citizens that built the town. The average year on the tombstone was 17 to 1800s, some ranging into 2000 to 2008. We went out there around the time of 12 p.m., just going around asking basic questions of anything that might be there. I stumbled on a gated burial dating 1825. I asked if he was there while someone was taking a video and pictures. All of a sudden, I got so tired and drained that I felt like we had to go. I felt like I was being attacked. When we got to the car, we reviewed the photos first. What I saw was disturbing. White, blue, and green lights flying all around me. Listening to the audio was even scarier. I heard an old man with a deep, crackly voice laughing and saying, Marissa and then I heard growling noises. I asked to leave immediately after hearing this. We were driving away, and about a half mile to a mile out, our car started doing really frightening stuff. The radio would turn on and off, headlights would stop working, our mirrors kept moving dramatically, the lights in the car were turning on and off. We pulled over, we were so scared. Eventually it stopped and we drove off, scared and confused as to what had just happened. When we arrived home, we could hear voices and banging in the house. We didn't sleep at all that night. I never did return, and until this day, eight years later, I can still hear that voice, and I hate driving by that cemetery.
When I was about 13, I was staying with a friend in the Colorado Rockies, the foothills, in January. While we were at his buddy's house, I walked to get food from a nearby gas station. On a small, windy country road, a car took a turn too fast, skidded on the ice, and rolled over in my direction. I was lucky that there were woods right to the side, and the dense trees saved me from the vehicle. As I ran away, I looked back, and I could only see his arm dangling limply out of the broken driver's side window. I was scared, and I still get shivers about it today. I think the person ended up dying just minutes later from the injuries. But for three days after that, I had strange dreams. They were very short, just small details. The feeling of grass, the moon, and a name. I only remember the last name now, Alton. On the fourth night, I had gone to bed early in an effort to get some sleep. I ended up drifting off at about 10 p.m., according to my friend's family. I heard a noise and woke up, but when I opened my eyes, I was laying right in front of a grave with the name Alton on it. It was a small village cemetery surrounded by pine trees. I would say it was less than 900 square feet. Despite it being mid-January in the mountains, there was no snow past the gate and in the cemetery. I was very cold though, and scared. I managed to locate a fire watchtower where they drove me back to my friend's house. This was no dream. I woke up in a cemetery and got taken back home. According to them, they went to check on how I was doing at about 1 a.m. and I wasn't in bed. Their home security said that I had left their back porch at 12.40 in the morning. When the park rangers picked me up, it was almost 3 a.m. I explained my story to my friends and family, and they told me that there was no cemetery behind their house. I told them what the area looked like, and they said that they had a clearing like that, but it didn't have any graves. They offered to take a look if I would lead them, but I was too shaken. I also remember there being a small gate in this fence. But before I went back home, that gate was gone and it was just a solid fence. I don't know what happened, but I'd really love some answers because it's been bugging me recently, so I decided to share my story. This is a silly story, but one that really solidified my belief that our reality is not what it seems. Either that, or my house has a very mischievous ghost. Last week, I put four rugs in the dryer. Three big rugs, and one smaller rug, which is about 24 by 18 inches. When the dryer was done, I opened it and I removed the rugs. Only three rugs came out. I looked into the dryer to make sure it wasn't somehow stuck to the top of it, even though it's too heavy to really do that, and it wasn't there. I was confused, so I looked in the washing machine. Not there. I looked behind the washer, behind the dryer, nothing. I looked in the hamper, the closet, the bathroom. That thing was nowhere. By this time I was really confused and annoyed. I looked in the dryer again, still empty. I then looked in both bedrooms, thinking that maybe I just thought I put it in the dryer, but I absentmindedly laid it down somewhere else instead. I looked all over the house for it and I couldn't find it anywhere. I checked the washing machine and the dryer one more time, still no rug. I even spun the dryer wheel and turned it just to make sure that it wasn't still in there somehow. And I even stuck my head in there, no rug. I let it go and decided that it will show up at some point, thinking maybe I threw it somewhere like a dresser drawer or put it in a box without thinking about what I was doing. The next day, around noon, I decided to do the sheets. So I threw the sheets into the washing machine and turned it on. Then I opened the dryer door to make sure that it was empty, having pretty much forgotten about the missing rug from the previous day. And there sat the rug, plain as day, 
laying in the dryer that I had checked multiple times. I couldn't believe it. I checked that dryer at least three times and it was completely empty. And now, out of the blue, there sits the rug. I live alone, by the way, and nobody has been in my house for months except me and my two cats. So, to this day, I have no explanation. This took place when I was a teenager, somewhere between 16 and 17. My dad was a truck driver, and I went with him for a couple of weeks in the summer. We were in Texas. I believe it was Fort Worth, but I'm not positive. We pulled into a truck stop and got out together to head into the store for something. On the way in, I saw a girl that I instantly recognized. She recognized me as well, and we basically ran into each other. We started enthusiastically catching up like old friends. I remember just being so excited to see her again, asking her how she'd been doing. My dad and her dad seemed puzzled when they reached us. Our dads did the whole small talk thing about being truckers and I really didn't pay attention to what they were saying. After a few minutes, they turned to us and asked how we knew each other. We both paused and realized that we weren't sure. My dad asked her name, and I realized I had no idea what it was. She didn't know mine either. Her dad seemed pretty freaked out by this, but nothing really rattled my dad that much. My dad went on to explain that it was my first time ever being out of Pennsylvania, where I was born and raised. It turns out she had never been outside of Texas. We were strangers. Then, it was like, in the moment, I realized we hadn't met before. I also suddenly couldn't even remember what we'd just been catching up about. I remember asking her how she was doing, but I don't remember her response. It was like as soon as our attention was drawn to the fact that we didn't know each other, the whole conversation disappeared from my memory. But I was so sure that we had had a detailed discussion about our lives just moments before. It became really awkward after that, and we all parted ways. My dad told me later that he had seen plenty of strange things being a truck driver his whole adult life and that I shouldn't let it bother me. But I still think about her and wonder what happened. I was so sure that I knew her, so sure that we had been very close, but I have no memory of her. And now I know that I had never seen her before and I've never seen her since. Quite a while ago, I was inside an Irish pub in Donegal, visiting my aunt on holiday. It was a music night in the pub, and my aunt was playing the fiddle. A couple were on guitar and bass, and the regulars in the pub sang along. As well as my family and I who were visiting, an American couple who were also visiting were in the pub having a pint. The American guy was really nice, offered me and my brother a coke, and about 30 minutes passed while we're in the bar together. I'm a little bit shy, and I'm thinking of ways to start a conversation and act social. The American guy's wife was talking to my mom, and I was thinking of saying something stupid to try my luck. The first thing that came into my head was, are you from Tennessee? I knew that they were Southern because of their accents, but I had no idea which state they were from. I decided it was a dumb idea, and I kept quiet, sipping my Coke. Five minutes pass, and my mom asks, so which state are you from? And the American woman replies, Tennessee. I was surprised by the odds, but I didn't really do anything about it. For the rest of the time that I was in the pub though, I just sat there thinking about the odds. Many people in many states have Southern accents. As far as I knew, it could have been any one of them. I don't know if it was a glitch in the matrix or what, but it just seemed a little bit too good to be true.
For my 30th birthday, my partner and I at the time were staying at a hotel in Maui that my mother had paid for as a birthday present. I thought it was fine, a little dated feeling. The bed looked out into the living room, which had a dark, void vibe at night, but I really didn't think anything of it at the time. Until my partner started talking about getting bad vibes on the second night. I told him to just brush it off. After the third night, I mentioned a weird dream that I had had, where I was in the hotel bed and I saw two silver strings pulling my feet off the surface of the bed. It felt lucid, because I rarely dream about the room that I'm actually in, unless I'm in partial sleep paralysis, which is rare. And this didn't feel like sleep paralysis, just a normal dream. My partner apparently had a dream about his body being lifted off the bed on the same night, and this freaked me out. I never have paranormal experiences, and I rarely get spooked, but by the fourth night, my partner said, I literally cannot spend another night here. Something is way off about this place. I asked him what was going on besides the weird dreams, and he said that he couldn't pinpoint it, but he was just unwilling to spend another night there. He had never gotten any sort of vibes like this in the past from any other place we'd been. So I had to tell our Airbnb host that we needed to leave early. We ended up not getting any refunds, and we sprung for a brand new hotel for the rest of the trip. I couldn't find anything on Google about the first hotel, and nothing else happened. It was just super bizarre, and my only paranormal adjacent experience. I still wish, though, that I could find out more information about the history of that hotel. Around 10 years ago, I was staying in an old bungalow where my nan lived. The bungalow itself always had a slightly creepy vibe to it, but I didn't pay it much attention. The temperature in the room that I stayed in would randomly drop very quickly out of nowhere. And whenever this happened, I could always sense a pressure difference, similar to how your ears feel when you enter a tunnel. One night I was asleep in bed and the temperature dropped so suddenly that it actually woke me up. Again, my ears felt like there was this big drop in pressure, as if all the sound and air had been drawn out of the room. I looked around the dark room, and there at the foot of my bed, looking up at me, was a face. It looked skeletal. The weird thing was, you would think that this would be terrifying, and if somebody described this happening to them, I would think how scary it must have been. But I felt no fear whatsoever. As ridiculous as it sounds, my mind just kind of rationalized it. Like, oh, that's weird. And then I must have just fallen back asleep. I just woke up the next day and went on about my business as normal, with no ill effects. And I never saw it again but I also never forgot it, because it was really, really odd. I was in the first grade when the librarian read us a story about a king whose daughter suffered from nightmares. He sent for a dream catcher, or a wizard, who could heal the princess from her traumatic dreams. I don't remember the details of the story, but I remember that the wizard could eat the bad dreams if you recited a certain phrase. My imagination came to life that night, and I will never forget it. I have not completely written off the following experience as all just a dream at 39 years old. I don't know how much of it was imagination and how much of it was something else, but it's still a cool story. I remember waking from a nightmare, which I had often, 
and I would usually run off to my mom and dad's room. This time, instead, I recited what I had learned. Dream catcher, dream catcher, please come eat my bad dreams. And then I hid under my covers, waiting. Soon I felt movement at the end of my bed, making its way to my pillow. I could see the shadow of this being as I poked my eyes out from under the blanket. It was long and caterpillar-like in shape, about the size of a very large cat. My pillow lifted, and then it slowly crawled down the bed. At this point, I was absolutely terrified as I held my breath. I couldn't believe this was happening. As soon as I felt the thing leave my bed, I ran to my mom and dad, screaming that something was there. Of course, nothing was out of place when inspected by my parents. I've never had sleep paralysis in my life, which is what most people chalk this experience up to be. I vividly recall the sound of my blankets as the thing moved, and the lifting of my pillow, which caused my stomach to drop. I don't know if anybody else has ever had something similar happen. I don't know if I took what I had learned from a storybook and actually called in some kind of demon, but whatever it was, I'll never forget it.